seven Jaspers existing <laughs> philosophy. Preface. The best introduction to Jaspers is his essay on my philosophy, which is here published in English for the first time, translated by Felix Kaufman. Except for the postscript, the original version dates back from 1941. The discussions of Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and of the encompassing are the first two lectures. Also unabridged from Reason and Existence, translated by William Earle. The lectures were first given and published in 1935. Jasper's interpretation of Kierkegaard and Nietzsche is discussed in chapter one. I have taken the liberty of correcting an inaccurate translation of one of the Nietzsche quotation. Another such quotation, which occurs under the heading No Prophecy, here near the end of section two, may be compared with a more faithful rendering in the Nietzsche chapter above. In the immediately preceding paragraph, Dancing, Mr. Earle, rather oddly, makes Kierkegaard and Nietzsche enemies of seriousness. They were, however, not one whit less, less serious than Jasper's. What they opposed and derided was gravity. One, on my philosophy, the course of my development, Roman numeral one, the course of my development. On February 23rd, 1883, I was born in Oldenburg, a son of Carl Jaspers, the former sheriff and later bank director, and his wife, Henriette Nea Tenson. I passed a well-guarded childhood in the company of my brothers and sisters, either in the country with my grandparents or at the seaside, sheltered by loved and revered parents, led by the authority of my father, brought up with a regard for truth and loyalty, for achievement and reliability, yet without church religion, except for the scanty formalities of the Protestant confession. I attended the high school of my hometown, and from 1901, the university. My path was not the normal one of professors of philosophy. I did not intend to become a doctor of philosophy by studying philosophy. I am, in fact, a doctor of medicine. Nor did I, by any means, intend originally to qualify for a professorship by a dissertation on philosophy. To decide to become a philosopher seemed as foolish to me as to decide to become a poet. Since my school days, however, I was guided by philosophical questions. Philosophy seemed to me the supreme, even the sole, concern of man. Yet a certain awe kept me from making it my profession. Instead, I felt that I should look for my vocation in practical life. At first, I chose the study of law with the intention of becoming an attorney. At the same time, I attended classes in philosophy. That proved disappointing. The lectures offered nothing of what I sought in philosophy, neither the fundamental experiences of being nor guidance for interaction or self-improvement, but rather questionable opinions making claim to scientific validity. The study of law left me unsatisfied because I did not know the aspects of life which it serves. I perceived only the intricate mental juggling with fictions that did not interest me. What I sought was perception of reality. Concern with art and poetry were incomplete substitutes. So even was an enthusiastic journey to Italy to see Roma Aeterna, to sense history and to gaze on beauty, 1902. This aimless way of life came to an end after my third semester. I began the study of medicine, impelled by a desire for knowledge of facts and of man. This resolution to do disciplined work tied me to both laboratory and clinic for a long time to come. Ostensibly, I was aiming at the practice of medicine, yet already with the secret thought of eventually pursuing an academic career at, u at the university, though actually not in philosophy, but in psychiatry or psychology. After some years, since 1909, I published my psychopathological researches. In 1913, I qualified as university lecturer in psychology. Up until then, my life had been a spiritual striving in what was actually politico-sociological space, untroubled by general happenings and without political consciousness, though with momentary forebodings of possible distant dangers, all intentness centered on my own private life. 
on the high moments of intimate communion with those closest to me, contemplation of the works of the Spirit, research, continual intercourse with things timeless, were the purpose and meaning of life's activities. Then, in 1914, the World War caused the great breach in our European existence. The paradisiacal life before the World War, naive despot, all its sublime spirituality, could never return. Ah, naive despite its, uh, its, uh, all its sublime spirituality could never return. Philosophy, with its seriousness, became more important than ever. To a great extent, my psychology had assumed the characteristics without my being conscious of it, of what I subsequently called existence clarification. This psychology was no longer merely an empirical statement of the facts and laws of events. It was an outline of the potentialities of the soul which holds a mirror up to man to show him what he can be, what he can achieve, and how far he can go. Such insights are meant as an appeal to freedom, to let me choose in my interaction what I really want. As the realization overcame me that at that time there was no true philosophy at the universities, I thought that facing such a vacuum, even he, who was too weak to create his own philosophy, had the right to hold forth about philosophy, to declare what it once was and what it could be. Only then, approaching my 40th birthday, I made philosophy my life's work. Roman numeral two, making tradition our own. We can ask primal questions, but we can never stand near the beginning. Our questions and answers are in part determined by the historical tradition in which we find ourselves. We apprehend truth from our own source within the historical tradition. The content of our truth depends upon our appropriating the historical foundation. Our own power of generation lies in the rebirth of what has been handed down to us. If we do not wish to slip back, nothing must be forgotten. But if philosophizing is to be genuine, our thoughts must arise from our own source. Hence, all appropriation of tradition proceeds from the intentness of our own life. The more determinedly I exist as myself within the conditions of the time, the more clearly I shall hear the language of the past, the nearer I shall feel the glow of its life. In what way the history of philosophy exists for us is a fundamental problem of our philosophizing which demands a concrete solution in each age. Philosophy is tested and characterized by the way in which it appropriates its history. It might seem to us that the truth of present-day philosophy manifests itself less in the formation of new fundamental concepts as borderline situation, the encompassing, than in the new sound it makes audible for us in old thoughts. A merely theoretical contemplation of the history of philosophy is insufficient if philosophy is practiced, a demand to know the manner in which its history is to be studied is entailed. A theoretical attitude towards it, toward it becomes real only in the living appropriation of its contents from the texts. To apprehend thought with indifference prevents its appropriation. Knowledge that does not concern the knower comes between the content of the knowledge of knowledge and its resurrection but in the assimilation of philosophy by later ages a lapse of thought is a constant feature concepts which were originally reality pass through history as pieces of learning or information what was once life becomes a pile of dead husks of concepts and these in turn become the subject of an objective history of philosophy Everything depends, therefore, on encountering thought at its source. Such thought is the reality of man's being, which achieved consciousness and understanding of itself through it. Though one needs knowledge of the concepts that emerge in history of philosophy, the purpose of such knowledge remains to gain, in, to gain entrance to the exalted living practice of these past thoughts. My own being can be judged by the depths I reach in making these historical origins my own. There is no palpable criterion for this in outward appearances. Such true thinking goes through history as a mystery, which can reveal itself, however, to everyone with understanding, for this hidden thinking was once reality. 
having been written down, it can be rediscovered. At any time, it can spark a new blaze. The history of philosophy is not, like the history of the sciences, to be studied with the intellect alone. That which is receptive in us and that which impinges upon us from history is the reality of man's being, unfolding itself in thought. A philosophical history of philosophy has the following characteristics. One, the real import of history is the great, the unique, the irreplaceable. The great philosophers and the great works are standards for the selection of what is essential. Everything that we do in studying the history of philosophy ultimately serves their better understanding. All other questions are secondary, as for instance, whether the great is also the most effective, or whether, perhaps, precisely the misunderstanding of greatness has a wider public appear, <laughs> appeal, because its mediocrity and its lowered standard, because of its mediocrity and its lowered standard. How the quality of greatness appears to us with constant transposition and questioning in the totality of things, what we prefer and how we prefer it, that must prove its worth by our ability to see through the remainder, the widespread, the universally prevalent in order to judge it fairly and to appreciate it. What remains strange and incomprehensible to us is a limit to our own truth. Two, understanding of the ideas demands a thorough study of the texts. Philosophy can only be approached with the most concrete comprehension. A great philosopher demands unrelenting penetration into his texts. This necessitates both the realization of a whole philosophy in its entirety and taking pains with every single sentence in order to become conscious of its every nuance. Comprehensive perception and accurate observation are the basis of our understanding. Three, understanding of philosophy demands a universal historical view. As a universal history of philosophy, the history of philosophy must become one great unity. Philosophizing as it occurs in each historical age involves the penetration without limit into the unity of the revelation of being. This solitary but vast moment of a few millennia emerging from three different sources, China, India, Occident, is real by virtue of a single internal connection though too immense to be envisaged as a pattern, it encompasses us nevertheless as a world. No one can attain that concrete nearness everywhere. He can have his roots only in relatively, only in relatively few sublime works. The immensity of the whole and the evocative tones of its unity are indispensable for achieving universal philosophic communication as well as for realizing the truth of each individual's concrete understanding. For the philosopher's invisible realm of the spirit. The philosopher lives, as it were, in a hidden, non-objective community to which every philosophizing person secretly longs to be admitted. Philosophy has no institutional reality and is not in competition with the church, the state, the real communities of the world. Any objectification, whether it be the formation of schools or sects, is the ruin of philosophy, for the freedom that can be attained in philosophizing cannot be handed down by the doctrine of an institution. Only as an individual can man become a philosopher. From becoming a philosopher he can derive no claims. He must not have the folly to wish to be recognized as a philosopher. Professorships in philosophy are instituted for free meditation of ideas by teaching mediation of ideas by teaching, which does not preclude, preclude their being held by philosophers, Kant, Hegel, Schelling, but in philosophy's realm of the spirit there is no objective certainty and no confirmation. In the realm of the spirit, men become companions in thought through the millennia, become occasions for each other to find the way to truth from their own source, although they cannot present each other with ready-made truth. It is a self-development of individual 
in communication with individual. It is a development of the individual into community and from there to the plane of history without breaking with contemporary life. It is the effort to live from and on behalf of the fundamenta. Though these become audible to him who philosophizes without objective certainty as in religion and only through indirect hints as possibilities in the totality of philosophy. Five. The universal historical view is a condition for the most decisive consciousness of one's own age. What can be experienced today becomes fully tangible only in the face of humanity's experiences, both those which can no longer be relived and those which become a living experience for the first time this very day. Only through being conscious can the contents of the past transmuted into possibilities, become the fully real contents of the present. The life of truth in the realm of the spirit does not remove man from his world, but makes him effective for serving his historical present. present. These fundamental views of history develop only slowly in me. I discovered that the study of past philosophers is of little use unless our own reality enters into it. Our reality alone allows the thinkers' questions to become comprehensible. We can thereby read their works as if all philosophers were contemporaries. The order in which the great stars of the philosophers' heaven rose for me is perhaps accidental. When I was still at school, Spinoza was king. Kant then became the philosopher for me and has remained so. In the voices of Plotinus, Nicholas of Cusa, Bruno, and Schelling, I heard as truth the dreams of the metaphysicians. Kierkegaard located consciousness both of the source, which is so indispensable today, and of our own historical situation. Nietzsche gained importance for me only late as the magnificent revelation of nihilism and the task of overcoming it. In my youth I had avoided him, repelled by the extremes, the rapture, and the diversity. Goethe contributed the atmosphere of humanitas and unself-consciousness. To breathe this atmosphere, to love with Goethe, whatever is essential among the apparitions of the world, and like him to touch with all the unveiled boundaries, was a blessing amid the unrest, and became a source of justice and reason. Hegel for a long time remained a well-nigh inexhaustible material for study, particularly for my teaching activity in seminars. The Greeks were always there. After the discipline of their coolness, I liked to turn to Augustine. However, despite the depth of his existential clarification, displeasure with his rhetoric and with his lack of all scientific objectivity and with his ugly and violent emotions drove me back again to the Greeks. Only finally, I occupied myself more thoroughly with Plato, who now seemed to me perhaps the greatest of all. Among my deceased contemporaries, I owe what I am able to think those closest to me accepted, above all to the one and only Max Weber. He alone, through his being, showed me what human greatness can be. Nistel, the brain anatomist and psychiatrist, set an example for me in the years I worked under him of critical research and the purest scientific method. Even in the history of philosophy, we can witness the tremendous incisiveness, the tremendous incisiveness of our rage. Hegel is a consummation of two and a half millennia of thought. True, in his basic philosophic attitude, although not in his concrete positions, Plato is an active, is as active today as ever, perhaps more than ever. Even now, we can philosophize from Kant. In actuality, however, we cannot forget for one moment what has been brought about since by Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. We are so exposed that we constantly find ourselves facing nothingness. Our wounds are so deep that in our weak moments we wonder if we are not in fact dying from them. At the present moment the security of coherent philosophy which existed from Parmen... Hmm. Parmenides to Hegel is lost. This does not prevent us from philosophizing from the single foundation of man's being on which was based the thinking of those millennia in the Occident, which are now in some sense concluded. 
to become aware of this foundation in yet another way we are referred to India and China as the two other original paths of philosophic thought. Instead of slipping into nothingness at the disintegration of millennia, we should like to feel unshakable ground beneath us. We should like to comprehend in one historical whole the only general phenomenon which may permit posterity to probe its substance more deeply than has ever been done. The alternative, nothing or everything, stands before our age as the question of man's spiritual destiny. Roman numeral three drives to the basic questions. Philosophy did not mean simply cognizance of the universe. That results from the sum total of the sciences in constant interdetermination and transition. Nor epistemology, which is a subject of logic, nor the knowledge of the systems and texts of the history of philosophy. Such knowledge touches only the surface of thinking. Philosophy grew in me through my finding myself in the midst of life itself. Philosophical thought is practical activity although a unique kind of activity. Philosophic meditation is an accompaniment by which I attain being and my own self, not impartial thinking, which studies a subject with indifference. To be a mere onlooker were vain. Even scientific knowledge, if there is anything to it, is not a random observation of random object, for the critical objectivity of significant knowledge is attained as a practice, only philosophically in inner action. Philosophy as practice did not mean its restriction to utility or applicability, that is, to what serves morality or produces serenity of soul. The process in which knowledge is employed as a means of thinking out the possibilities that bear upon a finite objective is a technical, not a philosophical activity. Philosophizing is the activity of thought itself by which the essence of man in its entirety is realize in the individual man. This activity originates from life in the depths where it touches eternity inside time, not at the surface where it moves in finite purposes. Even though the depths appear to us only at the surface, it is for this reason that philosophical activity is fully real only at the summits of personal philosophizing, while objectivized philosophical thought is a preparation for and a recollection of it at the summits, uh, the activity is the inner action by which I become myself. It is the revelation of being. It is the activity of being oneself which yet simultaneously experiences itself as the passivity of being given to oneself. The mystery of this boundary of philosophizing at which alone philosophy is real is only circumscribed by the unrolling of thoughts in the philosophical work. Since the basic questions of philosophy grow as practical activity from life, their form is at any given moment keeping with the historical situation. But this situation is part of the continuity of tradition. The questions put earlier in history are still ours, in part identical with present ones, word for word after thousands of years, in part more distant and strange so that we make them our own only by translation. The basic questions were formulated by Kant with, I felt, moving simplicity. <laughs> One, what can I know? Two, what shall I do? Three, what may I hope? Four, what is man? Today these questions have been reborn for us in, charged, in changed form and thus become comprehensible to us anew also in their origin. The transformation of these questions is due to our finding ourselves in the kind of life that our rage produces. One, science has gained an ever-growing, overwhelming importance by its consequences. It has become the fate of the world. Technically, it provides the basis for all human existence and compels the unpredictable transmutation of all conditions. Its contents cause wonder and ever greater wonder. Its inversions cause scientific superstitious superstitions and a desperate hatred of science. Science cannot be avoided. It extends further 
than in Kant's time, it is more radical than ever, both in the precision of its methods and its consequences. The question, what can I know, therefore becomes more concrete and at the same time more inexorable. Seen from our point of view, Kant still knew too much in wrongly taking his own transcendental philosophy for conclusive scientific knowledge instead of philosophical insights to be accomplished in transcending, and too little because the extraordinary mathematical, scientific, and historical discoveries and possibilities of knowledge with their consequences were in great part still outside his horizon. Two, the community of masses of human beings has produced an order of life in regulated channels which connects individuals in a technically functioning organization, but not inwardly from the historicity the historicity of their souls, the emptiness caused by dissatisfaction with mere achievement, and the helplessness that results when the channels of relation break down have brought forth a loneliness of soul such as never existed before, a loneliness that hides itself, that seeks relief in vain in the erotic or the irrational, until it leads eventually to a deep comprehension of the importance of establishing communication between man and man. Even when regulating his existence, man feels as if the waves of events had drawn him beyond his depth in the turbulent ocean of history, and as if he now had to find a foothold in the drifting whirlpool. What was firm and certain has nowhere remained the ultimate. Morality is no longer adequately found on generally valid laws. The laws themselves are in need of a deeper foundation. The Kantian question, what shall I do, is no longer sufficiently answered by the categorical imperative, though this imperative remains inevitably true, but has to be complemented by the foundation of every ethical act and knowledge in communication. For the truth of generally valid laws for my actions is conditioned by the kind of communication in which I act. What shall I do presupposes how is communication possible? How can I reach the depth of possible communication? Three, we experience the limits of science as limits of our ability to know and, limit, and as limits of our realization of the world through knowledge and ability. The knowledge of science falls, fails in the face of all ultimate questions. We experience limits of communication. Something is lacking even when it succeeds. The failure of knowledge and the failure of communication cause a confusion in which being and truth vanish. In vain, a way out is sought, either in obedience to rules and regulations or in thoughtlessness. The meaning of truth assumes another value. Truth is more than what we call truth or rather correctness in the sciences. We want to grasp truth itself. The way to it becomes a new, more urgent, more exciting task. Our philosophizing can be subsumed thus within these three questions. What can we know in the sciences? How shall we realize the most profound communication? How can truth become accessible to us? The three fundamental drives for knowledge, for communication, and for truth produce these questions. Through them, we reach the path of searching. But the aims of this searching are man and transcendence, or the soul and the deity. At them, the fourth and fifth fundamental questions are aimed. In the world, man, this is number four, in the world, man alone is the reality which is accessible to me. Here is presence, nearness, fullness, life. Man is the place at which and through which Everything that is real exists for us at all. To fail to be human would mean to slip into nothingness. What man is and can become is a fundamental question for man. Man, however, is not a self-sufficient separate entity, but is constituted by the things he makes his own. In every form of his being, man is related to something other than himself. As a being to his world, as, a conscious, as consciousness to objects, as spirit to the idea of whatever constitutes totality, as existence to transcendence. Man always becomes man by devoting himself to this other, only through this absorption in the world of being, in the 
the measurable space of objects and ideas and transcendence, does he become real to himself? If he makes himself the immediate object of his efforts, he is on his last and perilous path. For it is possible that in doing so he will lose the being of the other, and then no longer find anything in himself. If man wants to grasp himself directly, he ceases to understand himself, to know who he is and what he should do. This confusion was intensified as a result of the process of education in the 19th century, the wealth of knowledge of everything that was produced, a state um, of everything that was, the wealth of knowledge of everything that was, produced a state in which it seemed that man could gain mastery over all being without yet being anything himself. This happened because he no longer devoted himself to the thing as it was, but made it a function of his education. Where humanity found itself, founds itself only on itself, it is experienced again that it has no ground beneath it. The question about humanity is pushed forward. It no longer suffices to ask beyond oneself with Kant, what may I hope? Man strives more decisively than ever for certainty that he lacks, for the certainty that there is that which is eternal, that there is a being through which alone he himself is. If the deity is, then all hope is possible. Five, hence the question, what is man, must be commented, must be complemented by the essential question, whether and what transcendence deity is. The thesis becomes possible. Transcendence alone is the real being. That the deity is suffices. To be certain of that is the only thing that matters. Everything else follows from that. Man is not worth considering. In the deity alone, there is reality, truth, and the immutability of being itself. In the deity, there is peace, as well as the origin and aim of man, who by himself is nothing, and what he is is and what he is, he is only in relation to the deity. But time and time again, it is seen. For us, the deity, if it exists, is only as it appears to us in the world, as it speaks to us in the language of man and the world. It exists for us only in the way in which it assumes concrete shape, which, by human measure and thought, always serves to hide it at the same time. Only in ways that man can grasp does the deity appear. Thus, it is seen that it is wrong to play off against each other the question about man and the question about the deity. Although, the world, although in the world only man is reality for us, that does not preclude that precisely the quest for man leads to transcendence. That the deity alone is truly reality does not preclude that this reality is accessible to us only in the world, as it were, as an image in the mirror of man, because something of the deity must be in him for him to be able to respond to the de deity. Thus, the theme of philosophy is oriented in polar alternation in two directions. Deum et animam scire cupio. I desire knowledge of God and the soul. And taking up again Kant's fundamental questions, five questions arose. The question of science, of communication, of truth, of man, and of transcendence. I shall now go a little further into the meaning of these questions, both into the impulses that led to them and into the preliminaries of a philosophical answer. One, what is science? In my youth, I sought philosophy as knowledge. The doctrines which I heard and read seemed to meet this claim. They reasoned, proved, refuted. They were analogous with all of other knowledge, yet they aimed at the whole rather than at single subjects. I soon found out that most philosophical and many scientific doctrines failed to yield certainty. My doubting did not become absolute and radical. It was not doubt in the style of Descartes. Such doubt, which I encountered later, I did not entertain in reality, but only as a kind of game. 
commencing at first with the sciences, my doubt questioned single assertions, each doubt being by way of an experiment. It shook my faith in the representative of science, though not in science itself, to discover that famous scientists propounded many things in their textbooks which they passed off as the results of scientific investigation, although they were by no means proven. I perceived the endless babble, the supposed knowledge. In school already I was astonished, rightly or wrongly, when the teacher's answers to objections remained unsatisfactory. The parson proved the existence of God from the failure of the stars to collide and paid no heed to the objection that the stars great distance from each other makes the probability of a coll collision small, or that maybe there are collisions which we do not observe because they have not yet involved us. I observe the pathos of historians when they conclude a series of explanations with the words, now things necessarily had to happen in this way. Well, actually the statement was merely suggestive ex post facto, but not at all convincing in itself. Alternatives seemed equally possible, and there was always the element of chance. As a physician and psychiatrist, I saw the precarious foundation of so many statements and actions, and beheld the reign of imaginary insights, e.g., the causation of all mental illnesses by brain processes. I called, I called all this talk about the brain, as it was fashionable then, brain mythology. It was succeeded later by the mythology of psychoanalysis and realized with horror how, in our expert opinions, we based ourselves on positions which were far from certain, because we had always to come to a conclusion, even when we did not know, in order that science might provide a cover, however unproved, for decisions the state found necessary. I was surprised that so much of medical advice and the majority of prescriptions were based, not on rational knowledge, but merely on the patient's wish for treatment. From these experiences, the basic question emerged. What is science? What can it do? Where are its limits? It became clear that science, to deserve its name, must be cogent and universally valid. Self-discipline in making assertions is necessary above everything to maintain the sharpest criticism, the clearest consciousness of method, the knowledge in which way, for what treason, and with what certainty I know in each case, neither skeptically to surrender everything, nor to seize something dogmatically as a conclusion in advance, but rather to retain the attitude of the researcher, accepting knowledge only on the way with its reasons, and relative to its viewpoints and methods, turned out to be far from easy. The attitude of mind is attainable only with an ever active intellectual conscience. As a consequence of this procedure, it appeared that cogent validity does not indeed exist and that it is a great privilege of man to be able to grasp it with clear judgment. It appears, however, that such scientific knowledge is always particularized, and it does not embrace the totality of being, but only a specific subject, that it affords no aim to life, has no answer to the essential problems that move man, that it cannot even furnish a compelling insight into its own importance and significance. Man is reduced to a condition of perplexity by confusing the knowledge that he can prove with the convictions by which he lives. If science with its limitation to cogent and universally valid knowledge can do so little, failing as it does, in the essentials, in the eternal problems, why then science at all? Firstly, there's an irrepressible urge to know the knowable, to view the facts as they are, to learn about the events that happen to us. For example, mental illnesses how they manifest themselves in association with those that harbor them, or how mental illnesses might be connected with mental creativity. The force of the original quest for knowledge disappears in the grand anticipatory gestures of seeming total knowledge and increases in mastering what is concretely knowable. Secondly, science has had tremendously far-reaching effects. The state of our whole world, especially for the last 100 years, is conditioned by science and its technical consequences. The inner attitude of all humanity is determined by the way and content of its knowledge. I can grasp the fate of the world only if I can grasp science. There is a fundamental question. Why, although there is radicalism, rationalism, and intellectualization wherever there are humans, has science emerged only in the Occident? taking former worlds off their hinges in its consequences 
and forcing humanity to obey it or obey it or perish. Only through science and face to face with science can I acquire an intensified consciousness of the historical situation. Can I truly live in the spiritual situation of my time? Thirdly, I have to turn to science in order to learn what it is in all science that impels and guides without itself being cogent knowledge. The idea is that master infinity, the selection of what is essential, the comprehension of knowledge and the totality of the sciences, all this is not scientific insight, but reaches clear consciousness only through the pursuit of the sciences. Only by way of the sciences can I free myself from the bondage of a limited dogmatic view of the world in order to arrive at the totality of the world and its reality. The experience of the indispensability and compelling power of science caused me to regard throughout my life the following demands as valid for all philosophizing. There must be freedom for all sciences so that there may be freedom from scientific superstition, i.e. from false absolutes and pseudo-knowledge. By freely espousing the sciences, I become receptive to that which is beyond science, but which can only become clear by way of it. Although I should pursue one science thoroughly, I should nevertheless turn to the others as well not in order to amass encyclopedic knowledge, but rather in order to become familiar with the fundamental possibilities, principles of knowledge, and the multiplicity of me uh, methods. The ultimate objective is to work out a methodology which arises from the ground of a universal consciousness of being and points up and illuminates being. Above all, the sciences are to be employed as a tool of philosophy. Philosophy is not to be ranged alongside them as a merely as merely another science, for even though it is linked to science and never occurs without it, philosophy is wholly different from science. Philosophy is the thinking by which I become aware of being itself through inner action. Or rather, it is the thinking which prepares the ascent to transcendence, remembers it, and in an exalted moment accomplishes the ascent itself as a thinking act of the whole human being. Two, how is communication possible? I do not know which impulse was stronger in me when I began to think. The original thirst for knowledge or the urge to communicate with man. Knowledge attains its full meaning only through the bond that unites men. However, the urge to achieve agreement with another human being was so hard to satisfy. I was shocked by the lack of understanding, paralyzed, as it were, by every reconciliation in which what had gone before was not fully cleared up. Early in my life, and then later again and again, I was perplexed by people's rigid inaccessibility and their failure to listen to reasons, their disregard of facts, their indifference, which prohibited discussion, the decisive moment buried, mm, their defensive attitude, which kept you at a distance, and at the decisive moment buried any possibility of a close approach, and finally their shamelessness, that bears its own soul without reserve, as though no one were present. When ready assent occurred, I remained unsatisfied because it was not based on true insight but on yielding to persuasion, because it was the consequence of friendly cooperation, not a meeting of true selves. True, I knew the glory of friendship and common studies in the cordial atmosphere of home or countryside, but then came the moments of strangeness, as if human beings lived in different worlds. Steadily the consciousness of loneliness grew upon me in my youth, Yet nothing seemed more pernicious to me than loneliness, especially the loneliness in the midst of social intercourse that deceives itself in a multitude of friendships. No urge seemed stronger to me than that for communication with others. If, if, uh, if never completed moment, if the never completed moment of communication succeeds with but a single human being, everything is achieved. It is a criterion of this success that there be a readiness to communicate with every human being encountered, and that grief is felt whenever communication fails. Not merely an exchange of words, no friendliness and sociability, but only the constant urge towards total revelation reaches the path of communication. The painful stimulus that was philosophically decisive was the question how I was myself to blame for the insufficiency of communication. The insufficiency was, indubitab was an um, was indubitable fact, but the fault could not lie within the others. I, too, am human like them. 
The same sources of inhibition of communication exist in me as in them. The interaction by which I train myself ha had to eliminate my self-concealment, arbitrariness, and obstinacy, and to compel me to strive towards a revelation that can never be completed. The philosophical insight became possible precisely through my own failure. We can only recognize that evil which is in ourselves. What we cannot be at all, we cannot understand either. The philosophical mood arose from the experience of insufficiency in communication. Occupation with mere objects, which does not lead somehow to communication, seemed wrong to me. Solitary devotion to nature, this deep experience of the universe in the landscape and the physical nearness of its shapes and elements, this source of strength for the soul, could be seen like a wrong done to other human beings if it becomes a means of avoiding them, and like a wrong done to myself if it tempted me to a secluded self-sufficiency in nature. Solitude in nature can indeed be a wonderful source of self-being, but whoever remains solitary in nature is liable to impoverish his self-being and to lose it in the end. To be near to nature and the beautiful world around me therefore became questionable, but it did not lead back to community with humanity and serve this community as background and as language. Subsequently, the question of my philosophizing with respect to all thought, uh, subsequently the question, what do they mean for communication, passed through my philosophizing with respect to all thought, all experience, and all subject matters. Are they apt to promote communication or to impede it? Are they tempters to solitude or heralds of communication? This led to the basic philosophical question, how is communication possible? What forms of communication can be accomplished? What is their relation to each other? In what sense are solitude and the strength to be able to be alone sources of communication? The answers are given, especially in the second volume of my philosophy, in terms of concrete representation. By psychological means, means and their principles will be treated in my logic. The thesis of my philosophizing is, drum roll please, the individual cannot become human by himself. Self-being is only real in communication with another self-being. Alone, I sink into gloomy isolation. Only in community with others can I be revealed in the act of mutual discovery. My only freedom can, exi can only exist if the other is also free. Isolated or self-isolating being remains, remains m mere potentiality or disappears into nothingness. All institutions that maintain soothing contact between men under unexpressed conditions and within unadmitted limits are certainly indispensable for communal existence, but beyond that, they are pernicious because they veil the truth in the manifestation of human existence with illusory contentment. Three, what is truth? The limits of science and the urge toward communication both point to a truth that is more a possession of the intellect. The cogent correctness of the sciences is but a small part of the truth. The correctness and its universal validity does not unite us completely as real human beings, but only as intellectual beings. It unites us in the object that is understood, in the particular, but not in the totality. Admittedly, men can be true friends through scientific research by means of the ideas that are realized in this process and the impulses toward existence that make their appearance in it. But the correctness of scientific knowledge unites all intellectual beings in their equality, as it were, as replaceable points, not, in its essence, as human beings. To the intellect, all else, in comparison with what is correct, counts only as feeling, subjectivity, instinct. In this division, Apart from the bright world of the intellect, there is only the irrational, in which is lumped together, according to the point of view, what is despised or desired. The impulse which pursues real truth by thought springs from the dissatisfaction with what is merely correct. The division spoken of previously paralyzes this impulse. It causes man to oscillate between the dogmatism of the intellect that transcends its transcends its limits and, as it were, the rapture of the vital, the chance of the moment, life. The soul becomes impoverished in all of mm, all the most multiplicity of disparate experience. 
the truth disappears from the field of vision and is replaced by a variety of opinions which are hung on the skeleton of a supposedly rational pattern. Truth is infinitely more than scientific correctness. Uh, communication, too, points to this more. Communication is the path to truth in all its forms. Thus, the intellect finds clarity only in discussion. How man, as an existence, as spirit, as existence, is, or can be, in communication, that is what allows all other truth to appear. The truth that makes itself felt at the boundary of science is the same that is felt in this movement of communication. The question arises, what kind of truth it is? We call the source of this truth the encompassing, to distinguish it from the objective, the determinant, and particular forms in which beings confront us. This concept is by no means familiar and by no means self-evident. We may clarify the encompassing philosophically, but we cannot know it objectively. At this point, the decision is made whether we can attain philosophizing, or whether we fall back again to the boundary where the leap to transcending thinking must be made. If such words as feeling, instinct, heart, drives, and affections, which are subjective, suggestive of psychological analysis, are claimed as sources of truth, then we merely name the basis of our life. But it remains in darkness, causing us to slip down into supposedly comprehensible psychology while actually everything depends on reaching the bright region of truly philosophical thought. The methods of transcending are the basis of all philosophy. It is impossible to anticipate briefly what they accomplish. Perhaps a few words may suggest, if not explain, what is meant. Everything that becomes an object to me approaches me, as it were, from the dark background of being. Every object is a determinate being, as this confronting me in, as this confronting me in a subject, subject, object, divid, okay. Everything that becomes an object to me approaches me, as it were, from the dark background of being. Every object is a determinate being, as this confronting me in a subject, object, division, but never all being, no being known as an object is the being. Does not the sum of all objects from the totality of being? No. Does not the sum of all objects form the totality of being? No. As the horizon encompasses all things in the landscape, so all objects are encompassed by that in which they are. As we move towards the horizon in the world of space without ever reaching it, because the horizon moves with us and reestablishes itself ever anew as the encompassing at each moment. So objective research moves towards totalities at each moment which never become total and real being, but must be passed through towards new vistas. Only if all horizons met in one closed whole, so that they formed a finite multiplicity, could we attain, by moving through all the horizons, the one closed being. Being, however, is not closed for us, and the horizons are not finite. On all sides, we are impelled towards the infinite. We inquire after the being which, with the manifestation of all encountered appearance and object and horizon, yet received itself. This being we call the encompassing. The encompassing, then, is that which always makes its presence known, which does not appear itself, but from which everything comes to us. With this fundamental philo philosophical thought, we must think beyond all determinate beings to the encompassing in which we are and to the encompassing which we are ourselves. It is a thought turns us round, as it were, because it frees us from the shackles of determinate being. Yet the thought of encompassing is only a first approach. In its brevity, it is still a purely formal concept with further elaboration modes of the encompassing soon emerge. The being of the encompassing is as such is world and transcendence. The being of the encompassing that we are is an existent consciousness in general, spirit, 
existence um, thus arises the task of clarifying all modes of the encompassing we become aware of the truth in its total possibilities its its, hmm, its extent its width and depth only with the modes of the encompassing the clarification of all the encompassing derives its motive from our reason and existence. The impulses in which we open ourselves without limit, in which we want to give language to everything that is, embrace, as it were, all that is most strange and most distance, distant, eking out a relation with everything, denying communication to, to what? probably seeking a relation with everything, denying communication to nothing. These we call reason. This word, to be distinguished radically from intellect, means the condition of truth as it can emerge from all modes of the encompassing. Philosophical logic is the self-comprehension of reason. Truth, in this comprehensive sense, in which the truth of the intellect and that of the sciences with it is but an element, is founded in the existence that we can become. What matters is that our life is guided by something unconditional which can only spring from the decision. Decision makes existence real, forms life and changes it in interaction, which, through clarification, keeps us soaring upward. When it is founded on decision, love is no longer an unreliable moving passion, but the fulfillment to which alone real being unve un uh, unveils itself. What must be done in thinking of life is to be served by a philosophizing that discovers truth by retrospection and by anticipation. This philosophizing has no meaning unless a reality of the thinker complements the thought. This reality is not profession or application of a doctrine, but the practice of being human which propels itself forward in the echo of thought. It is a movement, an upward soaring on two wings, as it were. Both wings, the thinking and the reality, must support the flight. Mere thinking would be an empty moving of possibilities. Mere reality would remain a dull unconsciousness without self-comprehension and therefore without unfolding. This philosophizing emerged for me from philo psychology, which had to change and become existence clarification. Existence clarification, in its turn, pointed to philosophical world orientation and to metaphysics. Finally, the sense of this thinking is understand itself. <laughs> Finally, the sense of this thinking is understands itself in a philosophical logic that considers not only the intellect and its products, judgment and conclusion, but discovers the foundation of truth in it, complete in its complete range, in the encompassing. Being is not the sum of objects, rather objects extend, as it were, towards our intellect and the subject object's division from the encompassing of being itself, which is beyond objective comprehension, but from which nevertheless all separate, determinate objective knowledge, determinate objective knowledge derives its limits and its meaning, and from which it derives the mood that it comes out of, that comes out of the totality in which it has significance. Um, hmm. Being is not the sum of objects. Rather, objects extend, as it were, towards our intellect in the subject-object division, from the encompassing of being itself, which is beyond objective comprehension, but from which, nevertheless, all separate, all separate, determinate objective knowledge derives its limits and its meaning and from which it derives the mood that comes out of the totality in which it has significance. Four, what is man? As a living being among others, man is the subject of anthropology. In his inner aspect, he is a subject for psychology in his objective structures, that is, in communal life, a subject for sociology. Man, in his empirical reality, can be a subject of research in many directions, but man is always more than he knows or can know about himself. As something knowable, man appears in his manifold empirical aspects. As a being that is known, he is always divided up into whatever he will reveal himself to be according to the methods of research employed. He is never a unity and a whole, never a man himself, once he has become the subject of knowledge. If I want to reassure myself philosophically about being human, I cannot, 
therefore stop at the knowable aspects of empirical man in the world. I cannot, therefore, stop at the knowable aspects of empirical man in the world. Man, in a way, is everything, as Aristotle says about the soul. Becoming aware of man's being means becoming aware of being in a time as a whole. Man is the encompassing that we are. Yet even as the encompassing, man is split, as I said before. We become aware of the encompassing that we are in a number of ways, as an existent, as a consciousness generally, as spirit, as existence. Man lives in his world as an existent, as thinking consciousness. Generally, he is searching oriented towards objects. He is searchingly oriented towards objects. As spirit, he shapes the idea of a whole in his world existence. As possible existence, he is related to transcendence through which he knows himself as given to himself in his freedom. How many achieves unity is a problem. Oh, how man achieves unity is a problem, infinite in time and insoluble. But it is nevertheless the path to his search. Man is less certain of himself than ever. In philosophizing, man is not a species of particular existence beside other existence, but he becomes clear to himself as something unique, something all-enclosing, something completely open as the greater potentiality and the greatest danger in the world as being the exception of being, as the communication of scattered being which in him reveals itself to itself. What is transcendence? Man is for us the most interesting being in the world. We as human beings ourselves want to know what we are and can be. But a constant occupation with man causes surfeit. It seems as if in that occupation the essential was missed, for man cannot be comprehended on the basis of himself, and as we confront man's being, there is disclosed the other through which he exists. For man as possible existence that is transcendence, but while man is in the world as a perceptive reality, transcendence is as if it were not there nor is it fathomable. Its being itself is doubtful, and yet all philosophizing is directed towards the goal of achieving certainty about transcendence. It may be objected that philosophy is mistakenly trying to achieve what only, origi what only religion can achieve. In the cults, religion offers the bodily presence, or at least experience of transcendence. It founds man on God's revelation. It points paths of faith in revealed reality, in mercy and salvation, and it gives guarantees. Philosophy can achieve none of that. If philosophizing is a revolving round transcendence, it must therefore have a relation to religion. The manner in which philosophy and religion react to each other is indeed an expression of their self-comprehension and of the depth of their realization. Historically, we see this relation in the form of struggle, of subordination, of exclusion. A final and unchanging relation is not possible. Here a boundary shows itself where the problem is not merely grasped by insight, but is actually solved. Man has become narrow. When religion is excluded by philosophy or philosophy by religion, when one side asserts dominance over the other by claiming to be the sole and most exalted authority, then man loses his openness to being and his own potentiality in order to obtain a final closing of knowledge. But even this remains close to him. He becomes, whether he limits himself to religion or to philosophy, dogmatic, fanatical, and finally, with failure, nihilistic. To remain truthful, religion needs the conscience of philosophy. To retain a significant content, philosophy needs the substance of religion. Yet any formula such as this is too simple. For it obscures the fact that there is more than one original truth in man. All that is possible to avoid mistaking one all that is possible is to avoid mistaking one for the other. Philosophy, from its side, cannot wish to fight religion. It must acknowledge it, albeit as its 
polar opposite, yet related to it through this polarity. Religion must always interest it because philosophy is constantly stirred up, prodded, and addressed by it. Philosophy cannot wish to replace religion, compete with it, nor make propaganda on its own behalf against it. On the contrary, philosophy will have to affirm religion, at least as the reality to which it, too, owes its existence. If religion were not the life of mankind, there would be no philosophy either. Philosophy as such, however, cannot look for transcendence in the guarantee of revelation, but must approach being in the self-disclosures of the encompassing that are present in man as man, not in the proofs of the intellect or in the insights which the intellect as such might obtain, and through the historicity, historicity of the language of transcendence. The question, what is transcendence, is not answered, therefore, by a knowledge of transcendence. The answer comes indirectly by a clarification of the incompleteness of the world, the imperfectibility of man, the impossibility of a permanently valid world order, the universal failure, bearing in mind at the same time that there is not nothing but that in nature, history, and human existence, the magnificent is as real as the terrible. The decisive alternative in all philosophizing is whether my thinking leads me to the point where I am certain that from outside of transcendence is the source of the from outside, or whether I remain in eminence with the negative certainty that there is no outside that is the basis and goal of everything, the world as well as what I am myself. No proof of God succeeds in philosophy if it attempts to provide compelling knowledge. But it is possible for proofs of God to succeed as ways of transcending thought. Rational thinking can transcend the categories of all that is thinkable to the point where opposites coincide. It can go beyond them in the individual category, e.g. that of sufficient cause or purpose, to the, in fact, untenable thought of a lost cause and a final purpose. In that way, the necessity of seeking is understood and the baselessness of our merely factual existence, and our soul is kept open to the origin. The representation of the fragmentation of being and the radical contradictoriness present in every form demonstrates that nothing we can know endures through itself. Part of the externality, externality of transcendence is its unknowability. Its internality is the code message of all things. In view of the fact that the limit and the basis of all things can be made tangible, it is possible to perceive everywhere on the thread of light which connects them with transcendence. Even though transcendence is thus imminent, it is so only in an unlimited ambiguity and cannot be grasped with any finality. Philosophizing merely establishes the general right to trust in that which seems to speak to me as the light of transcendence. How I understand this language, however, is based on what I really am myself. And what I am myself is based on my original relations to transcendence. In defiance and in surrender, in falling away and in soaring up, in obedience to the law of day and in the passion of night. When I philosophize, I clarify and remember and prepare how, through these relations, I can experience eternity in time. The experience itself cannot be forced and cannot be proved. It is the fulfilled historicity of my existence. Philosophy can further demonstrate the consequences that appear when the interpretation of being wishes to restrict itself to pure imminence. It can lift the veils that threaten at all times to wrap man in untruth. It accomplishes this with unprovable propositions of the intellect, with supposed knowledge of the world as a whole, and with results seemingly scientific. But in doing away with pseudo-knowledge, philosophy does not establish a positive knowledge of transcendence comparable to scientific knowledge. Philosophy can clarify our conscience. It can show how we experience the demand of a universal law that we recognize as inevitable. 
At the boundary, it can show the real failure even of obedience to this law and cause the individual to feel anew the demand for unconditional obedience which addresses him in this historicity, though without universality or universal validity. And here again, philosophy can show the boundary and the failure in time. On all paths, it is essential to reach the source where in the highest consciousness the demand becomes audible in the world, which in spite of failing to be realized in the world, yet produces the true being through obedience to it. Philosophy can clarify that such a source is possible, yet what, so, what the source is and what it speaks cannot, uh, and what it speaks it cannot anticipate, for reality is historical and awaits every individual that arises anew in this world. Everything that philosophy says in substance and remembers in history remains relative insofar as it is utterable and has to be translated and appropriated in order to become a path to one's own original comprehension of the unconditional. In thinking along these lines, philosophy employs a twofold presupposition that is objectively unprovable but accomplishable in practice. First, man is autonomous in the face of all the authorities of the world. The individual, reared by authority at the end of the process of his maturation, decides in his immediacy and responsibility before transcendence what is uncondition uh, unconditionally true. Second, man is a datum of transcendence. To obey transcendence in that unconditional decision leads man to his own being. How can I, how I can succeed in reading the code message in the fullness of beings, in existing concretely in my relations with transcendence, in gaining my own being in historically formed obedience to transcendence, all this is conjoined to the fundamental question how the one is in the many, what it is, and how I can become certain of the one. Jasper's part two. Roman numeral four, my works. Three times thus far, I have attempted a systematic work. My general psychopathology, 1913. My psychology, a Weltanschauung, 1919. And my philosophy, 1932. In my psychopathology, I did not present everything on the basis of a theory and did not order my findings on the basis of total view of the matter. Rather, I developed the methods of research to demonstrate what is consequent to each method. The system was, in effect, a systemization of methods. The purpose of my work was liberation from dogmatic pseudo-knowledge, the strengthening of the open vision of research by a clear consciousness of their methods and their limitations. To know what I know, that is by no means a matter of course in scientific practice. In my psychology of Belkinshaw, I try to present systematically the sum total of the human possibilities of faith, worldviews, and attitudes. It was an exuberant, youthful work, the contents of which I acknowledge as mine to this day, but the form of which was inadequate. I mean to let pass before me in pure contemplation whatever came, and yet in fact I traced the single truth of man's being that was to me the given one, conceived it as a synthesis of polarities, and everywhere demonstrated the stream of lapses, voids, inversions. It was hidden philosophy that here misunderstood itself as objectively descriptive psychology. In my philosophy, my systematic approach arose from the three methods of transcending. In world orientation, by means of a compelling transcendence, I came to a consciousness of the apparency of all existence. Volume 1. Transcending, from this basis, I make myself aware by means of existence clarification of what I myself actually am and can be, volume two, from both presuppositions, transcending toward transcendence becomes clear in metaphysics. 
I pursue the paths of thought along which being itself presents itself to me. In contradistinction to the two previous works, my philosophy is formed throughout with conscious discipline. It was no longer simple to present for the transcending that occurs in the act of the accomplishment had to be developed anew each time as a calm breath of thought. Thus every chapter is unified by a single pervading movement. The chapters can only be understood as a whole in this movement of the idea, but each chapter can be understood by itself. The content of the philosophy, however, does not lie in its systematic basic ideas, but in that which happens through it. As my psychopathology was not objective in its systematization, but methodological, so my later philosophizing is not ontological, but incursive. It does not know what is, but it clarifies the encompassing. What is important lies in the special contents and expositions. Around these three major works are grouped some minor writings. A series of psychiatric publications and journals belong to my psychopathology. The essay Strindberg and Van Gogh belongs to my psychology of Weltanschauung. Then follow years of respite and concentration of my thinking before my philosophy to which the spiritual situation of the time published in English translation under the title Man in the Modern Age belongs appeared. Since then I see my task contained in two projects which seem to me as if they will be the concluding work of my life. I have been working on both of these continually for many years. I call them philosophical logic and universal history of philosophy. With my philosophical logic I seek to make a contribution to the logical self-consciousness of this age that belongs as much to our newly acquainted philosophizing as did Hegel's logic to idealism or inductive logic, that of John Stuart Mill, for example, to the positive, to, uh, the positivist age. Here the systematic basic thoughts themselves become the essential content. In my universal history of philosophy, I aim to present historically known philosophizing, without chronological order, as the one great phenomenon, always coherent in itself, of the revelation of being in humanity how from its roots in China, India, Greece, it developed in great cycles, constantly conditioned by socio social circumstances and psychological events. In relation to science and religion, echoing art and poetry, how it strives toward a single great organized unity of opposites which at the boundaries fail to yield solutions in time and in failing bring awareness to the truth of transcendent being. These works do not yet exist. Parts of my logic have been communicated in lectures that I gave in Groningen, Vernunf und Existenz, Groningen, 1935, English translated by William L. Reason and Existenz, Nunde Press, New York, 1955, close bracket, close parentheses, and in Frankfurt, open parentheses, ex existence of philosophy, Berlin, 1938, close parentheses, of my historical studies works on Nietzsche, parentheses, Berlin, 1936, close parentheses, and Descartes, parentheses, Berlin, 1937, close parentheses, have been published. My Nietzsche was to be an introduction to the shaking up of thought from which existence philosophy must spring. In my Descartes, I wanted to present historically, typically modern errors at their root vis-a-vis -vis mistaking speculative thought for rationally cogent insight and the disaster of inversion of modern science, which appeared when the science began to flourish and has remained side by side with it ever since. Ever since, logic and history of philosophy are complementary. One can hardly be grasped without the other, work on the one, therefore benefits work on the other. What is being developed there as the world of thought is demonstrated here as the reality of thought. My philosophizing has ever stood against the system as a totality in which being and truth lie clearly before one's eyes and find their presentation in a book. 
but at the same time I was systematic in my thought from the beginning, insofar as I looked for order, continuity, and relation of my thoughts to each other. System wrongly tries to seize being. The systematic approach aims methodically at securing the availability for the further course of philosophy of whatever means have been developed. The will against the system does not exclude the systematic approach. In fact, without this approach, that will lean, that will would lead to chaos. To develop the systematic approach as an organon of reason and a logic, that seems to me to be the most important task of today. Roman numeral five, epilogue. What I planned in 1941 has only been accomplished in part. The years that followed, with their dangers and their hygienically, hygienically uh, uncongenial circumstances, sapped my ability to work and finally made work impossible. After 1945, the problems of the day supervened. The philosophical work remained in the background. Since then, the first volume of my philosophical logic has appeared under the title of Truth. It is the fourth attempt at a systematic outline. In addition, a completely rewritten edition of my general psychopathology appeared. Though my fundamental approach is the same, it has become a new book. A series of smaller writings of the last years are attempts to make available to wider circles and a shorter form some of the material that escapes attention in my more extensive works. 2. Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. Roman numeral 1. Historical Reflections. The Contemporary Situation. The rational is not thinkable without its other, the non-rational. And it never appears in reality without it. The only question is in what form the other appears, how it remains in spite of all, and how it is to be grasped. It is appropriate for philosophizing to strive to absorb the non-rational and counter-rational, to form it through reason, to change it into a form of reason, Indeed, finally, to show it as identical with reason. All being should become law and order. But both the defiant will and honest mind turn against this they recognize and assert the unconquerable non-rational. For knowing this non-rational is found in the opacity of the here and now, in matter it is what is only enveloped but never consumed by rational form. It is an actual empirical existence which is just as it is and not otherwise, which is subsumed under just those regularities we experience and not others. It is in the contents of faith or religious revelation, all philosophizing which would like to dissolve being into pure rationality retains in spite of itself the non-rational. This may be reduced to a residue of indifferent matter, some primordial fact, an impulse, or an accident. The will utilizes these possibilities and knowledge to its own advantage. A battle arises for and against reason, opposed to pure transparent reason's drive toward rest within the conceivable, stands a drive to destroy reason not only to indicate its limits, but to enslave it. We want to subordinate ourselves to an inconceivable, super-sensible, which, however, appears in the world through human utterances and makes demands. Mm. Yeah. We wish to subordinate ourselves to the natural character of impulses and, act and passions, to the immediacy of what is now present. These drives are now translated by the philosophy which adheres to them, which adheres to them into a knowledge of the non-rational. Philosophy expresses its falling into the non-rational, the counter-rational, and even the super-rational as a knowledge about them. Yet, even in the most radical defiance of reason, there remains a minimum of rationality to show how the manifold distinction between reason and non-reason appears at the basis of all thinking would require an analysis of the history of philosophy out of its own actual principles. Let us recall a few selected points. To the Greeks, 
This problem of being was already present in myth. This clarity of the Greek gods was surrounded by the sublime incomprehensibility of faith, limiting their knowledge and power. Most of the philosophers touched incidentally, although in important ways, upon what was inaccessible to reason. Socrates listened to the forbidden voice, to the forbidding voice of the uncomprehended demon. Plato recognized madness, which, if pathological, is less than reason, but if divinely begotten, more. Only through madness can poets, lovers, and philosophers come to a vision of being. To be sure, according to Aristotle, in human affairs, happiness was the result of rational deliberation, but not totally. Happiness could appear without and even opposed to deliberation. For Aristotle, there were men, the allegory, who had a better principle than deliberative reason. Their affairs succeeded without and even in counter to reason. These examples stand alongside the general form of Greek thought, which opposed adherence to being, Parmenides, the void to things, Democritus, nothing to genuine being, Plato, and matter to form, Aristotle, in Christianity, the opposition between reason and non-reason developed as struggle between reason and faith within each man. What was inaccessible to reason was no longer regarded simply as other than reason, but was a revelation of something higher. In the observations of the world, the non-rational was no longer mere chance or blind chaos. Some astonishing principle surpassing reason but was taken comprehensively as providence. All the fundamental ideas of rationality or actually unintelligible faith could only be expressed in irrational antinomies, 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 even in rational, literal interpretation of faith became a heresy. In the succeeding centuries, on the other hand, Descartes and his followers attempted a radical grounding of reason upon itself alone. At least in the philosophy, in the philosophical excogitation of being which the individual accomplished by himself. Although Descartes left society, state, and church intact, the attitude of the Enlightenment arose as a consequence. But what I rapidly think and can empirically investigate, I can achieve the right organization of the world. Rational thought in the sense of presuppositionless universality is a thought in the sense of presuppositionless universality is a sufficient basis for human life in general. From the beginning, however, a counter-movement worked against this philosophy of reason, whether it be called rationalism or empiricism. This counter-movement was led by men who, although in complete possession of rationality themselves, at the same time saw its limits that other which was important before any reason, which made reason possible and restrained it. Over against Descartes stands Pascal. Over against Descartes, Hobbes. And Grotius stands Vico. Over against Locke, Leibniz. And Spinoza stands Bale. The philosophy of the 17th and 18th centuries seems to work itself out in these great <coughs> anti antitheses, antitheses. But the thinkers were irreconcilable, and their ideas were mutually, mutually exclusive. In contrast to this world of thought, the philosophers of German idealism made an astonishing attempt to create reconciliation seeing in reason more than reason itself. German philosophy in its great period went beyond all previous possibilities and developed a concept of reason which was historically independent. In Kant, a new beginning was created. This concept of reason got lost in the fantastic construction of Hegel, but broke through again in Fichte and Schelling. When one looks over the thought of centuries, the same thing always seems to happen. In whatever form this other to reason appears, 
In the course of rational understanding, it is either changed back into reason, or sometimes it is recognized as a limit in its place. But then, in its consequences, it is circumscribed and delimited by reason itself, or sometimes it is seen and, seemed, seen and developed as the source of a new and better reason. It is as though at the bottom of this thought, even in all its unrest, there always lay the quiet of a reason which was never wholly and radically questioned. All awareness of being grounded itself finally in reason or in God. All questioning was circumscribed by unquestioned assumptions, or else there were merely individual and historically inefficacious pioneers who never achieved a thorough understanding of themselves. The counter-movements against rationality were like a distant thunder announcing storms which could be released, but which were not yet. Thus the great history of Western philosophy from Parmenides and Heraclitus through Hegel can be seen as a thoroughgoing and completed unity. Its great forms, even today preserved in the tradition, and are rediscovered as the true salvation from the destruction of philosophy. For a century we have seen individual philosophers become objects of special studies and have seen restorations of their doctrines. We know the totality of past teachings in the sense of doctrines perhaps better than any of the early great philosophers, but the consciousness of a change into mere knowing about doctrines and about history of separation from life itself and from actually believed truth has made us question the ultimate sense of this tradition. Great as it is, and despite all the satisfaction it has provided and provides today, we question whether the truth of philosophy has been grasped, or even if it can be grasped in this tradition. Quietly, something enormous has happened in the reality of Western man, a destruction of all authority a radical disillusionment in an overconfident reason and a disillusion of bonds that have made anything, absolutely anything, seem possible. Work with the old words and appear as a mere veil which hid the preparing powers of chaos from our anxious eyes. This work seemed to have no other power than of a long-continued deception, a passionate revivifying intent of these words and doctrines, though done with good intentions, appears as, without real effect, an impotent call to hold fast. Philosophizing to be authentic must grow out of our new reality, and there take its stand. 2. Kierkegaard and Nietzsche The contemporary philosophical situation is determined by the fact that two philosophers, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, who did not count in their times and for a long time remained without influence in the history of philosophy, have continually grown in significance. Philosophers after Hegel have increasingly returned to face them, and they stand today unquestioned as the authentically great thinkers of their age. But their influence, both their influence and the opposition to them prove it. Why then can these philosophers no longer be ignored in our time? In the situation of philosophizing as well as in the real life of men, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche appear as the expression of destinies, destinies which nobody noticed then, with the exception of some ephemeral, ephemeral and immediately forgotten presentiment, but which they themselves already comprehended. As to what this destiny really is, the question remains open even today. It is not answered by any comparison of the two thinkers, but it is clarified and made more urgent. This compassion is all the more important since there could have been no influence of one upon the other, and because their very differences make their common features so much more impressive. Their affinity is so compelling from the whole course of their lives down to the individual details of their thought, that their nature seems to have been elicited by the necessities of the spiritual situation of their times. With them a shock occurred to Western philosophizing whose final meaning cannot yet be estimated. 
common to both of them is a type of thought and humanity which was indissolubly connected with the moment of this epoch and so understood by them. We shall therefore discuss their affinity, first in their thought, second in their actual thinking, existence, and third in the way in which they understood themselves. What is common to their thought? A questioning of reason, that's number one. Their thinking created a new atmosphere. They passed beyond all of the limits, then regarded as obvious. It is as if they no longer shrank back from anything in thought. Everything permanent was as if consumed in a dizzying suction, with Kierkegaard by another worldly Christianity which is like nothingness and shows itself only in negation. The absurd martyrdom and a negative resolution with Nietzsche, a vacuum out of which with despairing violence a new reality was to be born the eternal return and the corresponding dogmatics of Nietzsche. Both questioned reason from the depths of existence. Never on such a high level of thought had there been such a thoroughgoing and radical opposition to mere reason. This questioning is never simply hostility to reason. Rather, both sought to appropriate limitlessly all modes of rationality. It was no philosophy of feeling, for both pushed rem unremittingly toward the concept for expression. It is certainly not dogmatic skepticism, rather their whole thought strove toward the genuine truth. In a magnificent way, penetrating a whole life with the earnestness of philosophizing, they brought forth not some doctrines, not any basic position, not some picture of the world, but rather a new, total, intellectual attitude or reflection which is conscious of being unable to attain any real ground by itself. No single thing characterizes their nature. No fixed doctrine or requirement is to be drawn out of them as something independent and permanent. Suspicion of scientific men. Out of the consciousness of their truth, both suspect truth in the naive form of scientific knowledge. They do not doubt the methodological correctness of scientific insight, but Kierkegaard was astonished at the learned professors. They live for the most part with science and die with the idea that it will continue and would like to live longer than they might in a line of direct progress, always understand more and more. They do not experience the maturity of that critical point where everything turns upside down where one understands more and more that there is something which one cannot understand. Kierkegaard thought the most frightful way to live was to bewitch the whole world through one's discoveries and cleverness, to explain the whole of nature and not understand oneself. Nietzsche's inexhaustible and destructive analyses of types of scholars who have no genuine sense of their own activity, who cannot be themselves, and who, with their ultimately futile knowledge, aspire to grasp being itself. Against the system, the questioning of every self-enclosed rationality which tries to make the whole truth communicable made both radical opponents of the system, that is, the form which philosophy had had for centuries and which had achieved its final polish in German idealism. The system is for them a detour from reality and is therefore lies and deception. Kierkegaard granted that empirical existence could be a system for God, but never for an existing spirit. System corresponds with what is closed and settled, but existence is precisely the contrary. The philosopher of systems as a man, like someone who builds a castle, but lives next door in a shanty. Such a fantastical being does not himself live within what he thinks, but the thought of man must be the house in which he lives, or it will become perverted. The basic question of philosophy, what it, what it itself is, and what science is, is posed in a new and unavoidable form. Nietzsche wanted to doubt better than Descartes, and saw in Hegel's miscarried attempt to make reason evolve nothing but Gothic heaven storming. The will to system is for him a lack of honesty. Being as interpretation. What authentic knowing is was expressed by both 
in the same way. It is for them nothing but interpretation. They also understood their own thought as interpretation. Interpretation, however, reaches no end. Existence for Nietzsche is capable of infinite interpretation. What has happened and what was done is for Kierkegaard always capable of being understood in a new way. As it is interpreted anew, it becomes a new reality which is yet hidden. Temporal life can therefore never be correctly understood by men. No man can absolutely penetrate through his own consciousness. Both apply the image of interpretation to knowledge of being, but in such a fashion that being is as if deciphered in the interpretation of the interpretation. Nietzsche wanted to uncover the basic text, homo natura, from its over paintings, and read it in its reality. Kierkegaard gave his own writings no other meaning than that they should read again the original text of individual human existential relations. Masks. With this basic idea is connected the fact that both the most open and candid of thinkers had a misleading aptitude for concealment and masks. For them, masks necessarily belong to the truth. Indirect communication becomes for them the sole way of communicating genuine truth. Indirect communication as expression is appropriate to the ambiguity of genuine truth and temporal existence, in which process it must be grasped through sources in every existence, being itself, both in their thinking, pushed toward that basis which would be being itself in man, in opposition to the philosophy which from Paramid Parmenides, Parmenides, through Descartes to, uh, to Hegel, said, thought is being. Kierkegaard asser asserted the proposition, as you believe, so are you. Faith is being. Nietzsche saw the will to power, but faith and will to power are mere signa, which do not directly connote what is meant, but are themselves capable of endless explication. Honesty. With both, there is a decisive drive toward honesty. This word for them both is the expression of the ultimate virtue to which they subject themselves. It remains for them the minimum of the absolute, which is still possible, although everything else becomes involved in a bewildering questioning. It becomes for them also the dizzying demand for a veracity, which, however, uh, brings even in itself brings even itself into question, and which is the opposite of that violence which would like to grasp the truth in a literal and barbaric certitude. Their readers. One can question whether in general in anything is said in such thought. In fact, both Kierkegaard and Nietzsche were aware that the comprehension of their thought was not possible to the man who only thinks it is important who it is that understands. They turn to the individuals who must bring with them and forth and bring forth from themselves what can only be said indirectly. The epigram of Lichtenberg applies to Kierkegaard and he himself cites it. Such works are like mirrors. If an ape peeks in, no apostle will look out. Nietzsche says one must have earned for oneself the distinction necessary to understand him. He held it impossible to teach the truth where the mode of thought is based. Both seek the reader who belongs to them. Two, their thinking existence in its actual setting, the age. Such thinking is grounded in the existence of Kierkegaard and Nietzsche insofar as it belongs to their age in a distinctive way. That no single idea, no system, no requirement is decisive for them follows from the fact that neither thinker expressed his epoch at his peak, that they constructed no world, nor any image of a passing world. They did not feel themselves to be a positive expression of their times. They rather expressed what it was negatively through their very being, an age absolutely rejected by them and seen through in its ruin. Their problem appeared to be to experience this epoch to the end in their own natures, to be it complete, completely in order, to be it completely in order to overcome it. This happened at first involuntarily, but then consciously 
through the fact that they were not representatives of their epoch, but needling and scandalous exceptions. Let us look at this a little closer. Their problem. Both had become aware of their problem by the end of their youth, even if unclearly. A decision which gripped the entire man, which sometimes was silent, was silent and no longer conscious, but which would return to force itself upon them, pushed them into a radical loneliness. Although without position, marriage, without any effective role in existence, they nevertheless appear as the great realist who had an authentic feeling for the depths of reality, perception of substantial change in essence of man. They touched this reality and their fundamental experience of their epoch as ruins. Looking back over centuries, back to the beginnings in Greek antiquity, they felt the end of this whole history at the crucial point. They called attention to this moment without wanting to survey the meaning and course of history as a whole. Men have tried to understand this epoch in economic, technological, history, clue, political, and sociological terms. Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, on the other hand, thought they saw a chance in the very substance of man. Kierkegaard looked upon the whole of Christianity as it is today, as upon an enormous deception in which God is held to be a fool. Such Christianity has nothing to do with that of the New Testament. There are only two ways, either to maintain the deception through tricks and conceal the real conditions, and then everything comes to nothing, or honestly to confess the misery that in truth today not one single individual is born who can pass for a Christian in the sense of the New Testament. Not one of us is a Christian, but rather we live in a pious softening of Christianity. The confession will show, if there is anything true, thus in this honesty, if it has the approval of providence, if not, then everything must again be broken, so that in this horror, individuals can arise again, who can support the Christianity of the New Testament. Nietzsche expressed the historical, the historical situation of the epoch in one phrase, God is dead, thus common to both is an historical judgment on the very substance of their times. They saw before them nothingness. Both knew the substance of what had been lost, but neither willed nothingness. If Kierkegaard presupposed the truth, or the possibility of truth of Christianity, and Nietzsche, on the other hand, found in atheism not simply a loss, but rather the greatest opportunity, still, what is common to both is a will toward the substance of being toward the nobility and value of man. They had no political program for reform, no program at all. They directed their attention to no single detail, but rather wanted to affect something through their thought, which they foresaw in no clear detail. For Nietzsche, this indeterminateness was his larger politics at long range. For Kierkegaard, it was becoming a Christian in the new way of indifference to all worldly being. Both in their relation to their epoch were possessed by the question, question of what will become of man. Modernity overcome. They are modernity itself, in a somersaulting form. They ran it to the ground and overcame it by living it through to the end. We can see how both experienced the distress of the epoch, not passively, but suicidally, through totally doing what most only half did. First of all, in their endless reflection, and then in opposition to this, in their drive toward the basic. And finally, in the way in which, as they sank into the bottomless, they grasped hold upon the transcendent. A. Unlimited reflection. The age of reflection has, since Fichte, been characterized as reasoning without restraint as the dissolving of all authority, as the surrender of content which gives to thinking its measure, purpose, and meaning. So that from now on, 
without hindrance, and as an indifferent play of the intellect that can fill the world with noise and dust. Kierkegaard and Nietzsche did not oppose reflection in order to annihilate it, but rather in order to overcome it by limitlessly engaging in it and mastering it. Man cannot sink back into an unreflective immediacy without losing himself, but he can go this way to the end, not destroying reflection, but rather coming to the basis in himself in the medium of reflection. Their infinite reflection has therefore a twofold character. It can lead to a complete ruin just as well as it can become the condition of authentic existence. Both express this. Perhaps Kierkegaard is the clearer of the two. Reflection cannot exhaust or stop itself. It is faithless since it hinders every decision. It is never finished, and in the end can become dialectical twaddle. In this respect, he called it the poison of reflection, but that is impossible indeed, necessary, lies. But that is as possible indeed necessary lies grounded in the endless ambiguity of all existence and action for us. Anything can mean something else for reflection. This situation makes possible on one side a sophistry of existence, enables the existence less, less esthete to profit, who merely wants to savor everything as an interesting novelty. Even if he should take the most decisive step, still he always holds before himself the possibility of reinterpreting everything, so that in one blow it is all changed. But on the other hand, this situation can be truly grasped by the knowledge that insofar as we are honest, we live in a sea of reflection where no one can call to another, where all buoys are dialectical. Without infinite reflection, we should fall into the quiet of the settled and established, which as something permanent in, to, in the world would become absolute. That is, we should become superstitious. An atmosphere of bondage arises with such a settlement. Infinite reflection, therefore, is precisely through its endless active dialectic. The condition of freedom, it breaks out of every prison of the finite, only in its medium is there any possibility of an infinite passion arising out of immediate feeling, which, because it is unquestioning, is still unfree. In infinite passion, the immediate feeling, which is held fast and genuinely true throughout the questioning, is grasped as free. But in order to prevent this freedom from becoming nothing through vacuous reflection, in order for it to fulfill itself, infinite reflection must strand itself, then for the first time does it issue out of something real, or exhaust itself in the decision of faith and resolution, as untrue as the arbitrary and forced arrest of reflection is, so true, is that basis by which reflection is mastered in the encounter of existence. Here existence is given to itself for the first time, so that it becomes a master of infinite reflection through total totally surrendering to it. Reflection which can just as well dissolve into nothing has become the condition of existence is described as such and in the same way by both Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. Out of it, they have imparted an almost immeasurable wealth of thought in their works. This thinking according to its own meaning is possibility. It can indicate and prepare the way for the shipwreck but cannot accomplish it. Thus, in their thinking about the possibilities of man, both thinkers were aware that they themselves were not in their thought. The awareness of possibilities and analogy to poetry is not false, but rather a questioning and awakening reflection. Possibility is the form in which I permit myself to know about what I am not yet, and a preparation for being it. Kierkegaard called his method most frequently an experimental psychology. Nietzsche called his thought seductive. Thus they left what they themselves were, and what they ultimately thought concealed to the point of unrecognizability and in its appearance sunk into the incomprehensible. Kierkegaard's pseudonym writes, The something which I am is precisely a nothing. It gave him a high satisfaction to hold his existence at that critical 
zero, between something and nothing, a mere perhaps. And Nietzsche willingly called himself a philosopher of the dangerous perhaps? Of the dangerous perhaps. Reflection is for both preeminently self-reflection. For them, the way to truth is through understanding oneself. But they both experience how one's own substance can disappear this way, how the free creative self-understanding can be replaced by a slavish rotation about one's own empirical existence. Kierkegaard knew the horror of everything disappearing before a sick bro brooding over the tail of one's own miserable self. He sought for the way between this devouring of oneself and observation as those one were the only man who had ever been, and the sorry comfort of a universal human shipwreck. He knew the unhappy relativity in everything, the unending question about what I am. Nietzsche expressed it. Among a hundred mirrors, before yourself false, strangled in your own net, self-knower, self-executioner, crammed between two nothings, a question mark. B. Drive toward the basic. The age which could no longer find its way amidst the multiplicity of its reflections and rationalizing words pushed out of reflection toward bases. Kierkegaard and Nietzsche were here to seem to be forerunners. Later generations sought the basic in general articulateness and the aesthetic charm of immediately striking in a general simplification, in unreflective experience, in the existence of things closest to us. To them, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche seemed useful, for both lived consciously with a passionate love for the sources of human compatibility, no, communicability. They were, created, uh, they were created in language to the degree that their works belonged to the peaks of the literatures of their countries, and they knew it. They were created in a thrilling way, which made them among the most widely read authors, even though the content was of the same weight, and their genuine comprehension of the same difficulty as that of any of the great philosophers. But both also knew that the tendency of the verbal to become autonomous, and they despised the literary world. Both were moved by music to the point of intoxication, but both warned of its seduction, and along with Plato and Augustine belonged to those who suspected it existentially. Everywhere they created formulas of striking simplicity, but both were full of concern before that simplicity, which, in order to give some deceptive support to the weak and mediocre, offered flat, spiritless simplifications in place of the genuine simplicity, which was the result of the most complicated personal development, which, like being itself, never had a single rational meaning. They warned, as no thinker before had, against taking their words too simply, words that, words which seemed to stand there, apodictically, apodictically. 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 Anyway. In fact, they went by the most radical way to the basic, but in such a fashion that the dialectical movement never stopped. Their seriousness was absorbed, neither into an illusion of the dogmatic fixedness of some supposed basis, nor into the purposes of language, aesthetic charm, and simplicity. See, arrest in transcendence. Both pursued a path which for them could not end short of a transcendental stop, for their reflections were not like the usual reflections of modernity stopped by the obvious limits of vital needs and interests. They, for whom it was a question of all or nothing, dared limitlessness, but this they could do only because from the very beginning onwards they were rooted in what was at the same time hidden from them, both in their youth, spoke of an unknown God. Kierkegaard, even when 25 years old, wrote, in spite of the fact that I am very far from understanding myself, I have revered the unknown God. And Nietzsche, at 20 years of age, created his first unforgettable poem to the unknown God. I would know thee, unknown, thou who grips deep in my soul, wandering through my life like a storm. Thou inconceivable, my kin, I would know thee, even serve thee. Never in their limitless reflection could they remain within the finite conceivable and therefore trivial, but just as little could they hold to reflection itself precisely because he had been 
thoroughly penetrated by reflection, Kierkegaard thought. The religious understanding of myself has deserted me. I feel like an insect with which children are playing. So pitilessly does existence handle me. In his terrible loneliness, understood by and really bound to absolutely no one, he called to God. God in heaven, if there were not some most inward center in a man where all this could be forgotten, who could hold out? Nietzsche was always conscious of moving on the sea of the infinite, of having given up land once and for all. He knew that, perhaps, neither Dante nor Spinoza knew his loneliness. Somehow they had had God, they had God for company. But Nietzsche, empty in his loneliness, without men and without the ancient God, envisaged Zarathustra and meditated upon the eternal return. Thoughts which left him as horrified, as happy. He lived continually like someone mortally wounded. He suffered his problems. He thought it, his thought is a self-arousal. If I had only the courage to think all that I know, but in this limitless reflecting, a deeply satisfying content was revealed, which was in fact transcendent. Thus both leaped toward transcendence, but to a form of transcendence where practically no one could follow. Kierkegaard leapt leaped to a, tra a Christianity which was conceived as an absurd paradox, as a decision for utter world negotiation and martyrdom. Nietzsche leapt to the eternal return and supermen. Thus the ideas, which were for Nietzsche himself the very deepest, can look empty to us. Kierkegaard's faith can look like a sinister alienation. If one takes the symbols of Nietzsche's religion literally, there is no longer any transcendental content in their will toward eminence. Aside from the eternal cycle of things, there is the will of power, the affirmation of being, the pleasure which wills deep, deep eternity. Only with circumspection and by taking pains does a more essential content emerge. With Kierkegaard, who revivified the profound formulas of theology, it can seem like the peculiar art of perhaps a non-believer forcing himself to believe. The, similar, the similarity of their thought is ever so much more striking precisely because of their apparent differences, the Christian belief of the one and the atheism emphasized by the other. In an epoch of reflection, where what had really passed away seemed still to endure, but which actually lived in an absence of faith, rejecting faith and forcing oneself to believe belong together. The godless can appear to be a believer, and the believer can appear as godless. Both stand in the same dialectic. What they brought forth in their existential thinking would not have been possible without a complete possession of tradition. Both were brought up with a classical education. Both were nurtured in Christian piety. Their tendencies are unthinkable without Christian origins. Mm -hmm. If they passionately oppose the stream of this tradition in the form of which it had come to assume through the centuries, they also found an historical and for them indestructible arrest in these origins. They bound themselves to a basis which fulfilled their own belief, Kierkegaard to a Christianity of the New Testament as he understood it, and Nietzsche to a pro-Socratic Hellenism. But nowhere is there any final stop for them. Neither in finitude, nor an explicitly grasped basis, nor in a determinately grasped transcendence, nor in, a his, in an historical tradition. It is as though their very being, experiencing the abandonment of the age to the end, shattered, and in the shattering itself manifested a truth which otherwise would never have come to expression. If they won an unheard of mastery over their own selves, they also were condemned to a worldless loneliness, they were as though pushed out, there being as exceptions. They were exceptions in every sense. Physically, their development was in retard of their character. Their faces disconcert one because, disconcert one because of their relative unobtrusiveness. They do not impress one as types of human greatness. It is as if they both lack something in their sheer vitality, as though they were eternally young spirits wandering through the world without really, without reality, because without any real connection with the world. <clears throat> 
Those who knew them felt attracted in an enigmatic way by their presence as though elevated for a moment to a higher mode of being, but no one really loved them. In the circumstances of their lives, one finds astonishing and alien features. They have been called simply insane. They would be, in fact, objects for a psychiatric analysis if they were not to the prejudice of the singular height of their thought and the nobility of their natures. Indeed, then they would first come to light, but any typical diagnosis or classification would certainly fail. They cannot be classed under any earlier type, poet, philosopher, prophet, savior, genius. With them, a new form of human reality appears in history. There are, so to speak, representative destinies, sacrifices, whose way out of the world leads to experiences for others. They are, by the total staking of their whole natures, like modern martyrs, which, however, they precisely denied being. Through their character as exceptions, they solved their problem. Both are irreplaceable as having dated, dared to be shipwrecked. We orient ourselves by them. Through them, we have intimations of something we could never have perceived without such sacrifices of something that seems essential, which even today we cannot adequately grasp. It is as if the truth itself spoke, bringing an unrest into the depths of our consciousness of being. Even in the external circumstances of their lives, we find astonishing similarities. Both came to a sudden end in their forties. Shortly before, without knowledge of their approaching end, they both made public and passionate attacks. Kierkegaard on church, Christianity, and on dishonesty, Nietzsche, on Christendom itself, both made liter literary reputations in their first repu yeah, reputations in their first publication, but then their new books followed unceasingly, and they had to print what they wrote at their own expense. They also both had the fate of finding a response which, however, was without understanding. They were merely sensations in an age when nothing opposed to them, the beauty and sparkle of language, the literary and poetic quality, the aggressiveness of their matter, all misled leaders, readers from their genuine intentions. Both toward the end were almost idealized, idolized by those with whom they had the least in common. The age that wanted to surpass itself could, so to speak, wear itself out in ideas casually selected out of them. The modern world has nourished itself on them precisely in its negligence. Out of their reflection, instead of remaining in the seriousness of endless reflection, it made an instrument for sophistry and irresponsible talk. Their words, like their whole lives, were savored for their great aesthetic charm. Aesthetic charm. Aesthetic. They dissolved what remained of connections among men, not to lead to the bases of true seriousness, but in order to prepare a free path for caprice. Thus their influence became utterly destructive, contrary to the meaning of their thought and being. Three, the ways in which they understood themselves against interchangeability, uh, interchangeability. Their problem became clearer to them from their youth onward through a continually accompanying reflection. Both of them at the end, and in retrospect, gave us an indication of how they understood themselves through a total interpretation of their work. This interpretation remained convincing to the extent that we today, in fact, understand them as they wish to be understood. All of their thought takes on a new sense beyond what is immediately comprehensible in it. The picture itself is inseparable from their work, for the fashion in which they understood themselves is not an accidental ad addition but an essential feature of their total thought. One of the motives in common for the comprehensible expression of their self-understanding is the will not to be mistaken for someone else. This was, as they said, one of their deepest concerns, and out of it, not only were they always seeking new forms of communication, but also they directly announced the total meaning as it appeared to them at the end. They always worked by all possible means to prepare a correct understanding of their work, through the ambiguity of what they said, their self-consciousness. They both had a clear perception of their epoch, seeing what was going on before them down to the smallest detail with a certitude that was overmastering. 
It was the end of a mode of life that had hung together for centuries, but they also perceived that no one else saw it. They had an awareness of their epoch which no one else yet had, but which presently others, and finally all, would have. Thus they necessarily passed into an unprecedented intensity of self-consciousness. Their existence was in a very special state of affairs. It was not just a simple spiritual superiority, which they must have noticed, Kierkegaard, over everybody who encountered him, Nietzsche, over most, but rather something monstrous, which they made themselves into unique, solitary world, historical destinies. Their consciousness of failure, of exceptionality, of loneliness. But this well-grounded self-consciousness, momentarily expressed and then suppressed again, as always with Kierkegaard, moderated through the humility of his Christian attitude, and with both, is tempered by psychological knowledge of their human failure. The astonishing thing with them again is that the precise mode of their failure is itself the condition of their distinctive greatness. For this greatness is not absolute greatness, but something that uniquely belongs to the situation of the epoch. It is noteworthy how they both came to the same metaphors for this side of their natures. Nietzsche compared himself to the scratchings which an unknown power makes on paper in order to test a new pen. The positive value of his illness is standing is his standing a problem? Is his standing problem? The positive value of his illness, illness is his standing problem. Kierkegaard thought he indeed would be erased by God's mighty hand, extinguished as an unsuccessful experiment. He felt like a sardine squashed against the sides of a can. The idea came to him that in every generation there are two or three who sacrifice for the others, who discover in frightful suffering what others shall profit by. He felt like an interdex interjection in speaking without influence upon the sentence, like a letter which is printed upside down in the line. He compared himself with the paper notes in the financial crises of 1813, the year in which he was born. There is something in me which might have been great, but due to the unfavorable market, I'm only worth a little. Both were conscious of being exceptions. Kierkegaard developed a theory of the exception through which he understood himself he loved the universal, the human in men, but as something other, something denied to him. Nietzsche knew himself to be an exception, spoke in favor of this exception, so long as it never wants to become the rule. He required of the philosopher that he take care of the rule, since he is the exception. Thus, the last thing either wished was to become exemplary. Kierkegaard looked upon himself as a sort of trial man. In the human sense, no one can imitate me. I am a man, as he could become in a crisis an experimental rabbit, so to speak, for existence. Nietzsche turned away those who would follow him. Follow not me, but you. This exceptionality, which was as excruciating to them as it was the unique requirement of their problem, they characterized, and here again they agree, as pure mentality, as though they were deprived of any authentic life. Kierkegaard said that he was, in almost every physical respect, deprived of the conditions for being a whole man. He had never lived except as mind. He had never been a man, at very most, child and youth. He lacked the animal side of humanity. His melancholy carried him almost to the edge of imbecility, and was something that he could conceal as long as he was independent, but made him useless for any service where he could not himself determine everything. Nietzsche experienced his own pure mentality as, through excess of life, through his radiance, condemned to be, not to love. He expressed it, he expressed it convulsively in the night song of Zarathustra. Light I am, ah, would that I were night. I live in my own light. A terrible loneliness bound up with their exceptionality was common to both. Kierkegaard knew that he could have no friends. Nietzsche suffered his own growing loneliness and full consciousness to the limit where he could endure it no longer. Again, the same image comes to both. Nietzsche compared himself to a fir tree on the heights overlooking an abyss. Lonely, who dares to be a guest who? Here, perhaps a bird of prey, floating in the hair of the branches. And Kierkegaard, like a lonely fir tree, egotistically isolated, looking towards something higher. I stand there, throwing no shadow, 
Only the wood dove building its nest in my branches. Providence and chance. In great contrast to the abandonment, failure, and contingency of their existence was the growing consciousness in the course of their lives of the meaning, sense, and necessity of all that happened to them. Kierkegaard called it providence. He recognized the divine in it. That everything that happens is said, goes on, and so forth is portentous. The factual continually changes itself to mean something far higher. The factual for him is not something to abstract oneself from, but rather something to be penetrated until God himself gives the meaning. Even what he himself did became clear only later. It was the extra which I do not owe to myself, but to providence. It shows itself continually in such a fashion that even what I do out of the greatest possible conviction afterwards I understand far better. Nietzsche called it chance, and he was concerned to use chance. For him, sublime chance ruled existence. The man of highest spirituality and power feels himself grown for every chance, but also inside a snowfall of con contingencies. But this contingency increasingly took on for Nietzsche a remarkable meaning. What you call chance, you yourself are that which befalls and astonishes you. Throughout his life he found intimations of how chance events which were of greatest importance to him carried a secret meaning, and in the end he wrote, there is no more chance. Dancing. At the limits of life's possibilities came not any heavy seriousness, but rather a complete lightness as the expression of their knowledge, and both used the image of the dance. In the last decade of his life, Nietzsche, in ever-changing forms, used to dance as a metaphor for his thought, where it is original, and Kierkegaard said, I have trained myself always to be able to dance in the service of thought. My life begins as soon as difficulty shows up, and dancing is easy. The thought of death uh, is a nimble dancer. Everybody is too serious for me. Nietzsche saw his arch enemy in the spirit of seriousness in moral science, purposefulness, etc., but to conquer seriousness meant not to reject it for the thoughtlessness of arbitrary caprice, but rather to pass through the most serious to an authentic soaring, the triumph of which is the free dance. No prophecy. The knowledge that they were exceptions prevented either from stepping forth as prophets to be sure, they seem like those prophets who speak to us out of inaccessible depths, but who speak in a contemporary way. Kierkegaard compared himself to a bird which foretells rain. When in a generation a thunderstorm begins to threaten, individuals like me appear. They are prophets who must conceal themselves as prophets. They are aware of their problem in a continual return from the extremities of their demands to rejection of any ideal to make them models or ways of life. Kierkegaard repeated innumerable times that he was not an authority or a prophet, apostle, or former, nor did he have the authority of position. His problem was to awaken them, yet a certain police talent, to be a spy in the service of his divinity, he uncovered. Wow, he did not assert what should be done. Nietzsche wanted to awaken the high suspicion against himself, explaining that to the humanity of the teacher belongs the duty of warning his students against himself. What he wanted, he let Zarathustra say, who left his disciples with, go away from me and turn yourselves against me. And even in Ecce Homo, Nietzsche says, and finally, there is nothing in me of the founder of a religion. I want no believers. I have a terrible anxiety that some day they will speak reverently of me. I will not be a saint, rather a punch. Maybe I am punch. The deed. There is in both a confusing polarity between the appearance of an absolute and definite demand and, at the same time, shyness, withdrawal, the appearance of not betting anything. The seductive, and perhaps the possible, is the matter of their discourse. An unreadiness to be leader was their own attitude. But both lived in secret longing to bring salvation if they could, and if it could be done in human honesty. 
According, they both toward the end of their lives became daring, desperate. And then, in utter form, rose to public attack. From then on, the reticence of merely envisaging possibilities was given up for a will to act. Both made a similar attack. Kierkegaard attacked the Christianity of the Church. Nietzsche attacked Christendom as such. Both acted with sudden force and merciless resolution. Both attacks were purely negative actions. These from truthfulness, not from the construction of a world. Roman numeral three, meaning of the philosophical situation produced by Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. The significance of Kierkegaard and Nietzsche first becomes clear through what followed in consequence. The effect of both is immeasurably great, even greater in general thinking than in tactical philosophy, but it is always ambiguous. What Kierkegaard really meant is clear neither in theology nor in philosophy. Modern Protestant theology in Germany, when it is genuine, seems to stand under either direct or indirect influence of Kierkegaard. But Kierkegaard, with regard to practical consequences of his thought, wrote in May 1885 a pamphlet with the motto, But at midnight there is a cry, Matthew 25, 6. Will he say, by seizing the third part in the official worship of God, as it now is, thou hast one guilt less, thou dost not participate in treating God as a fool, calling it the Christianity of the New Testament, which it is not. One, ambiguity, uh, ambiguity of both. In modern philosophy, several decisive themes have been developed through Kierkegaard. Most essential basic categories of contemporary philosophy seem, at least in Germany, go back to Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard, whose whole thought, however, appeared to dissolve all previous systematic philosophy and to reject speculation, and who, in his recognized philosophy, said at most, Philosophy can pay attention to, but cannot nourish us. It might be that theology, like philosophy, when it follows Kierkegaard, is masking something essential in order to use his ideas and formulas for his own totally different purposes. It might be within theology there is an unbelief which implies the refined Kierkegaard and intellectual techniques of dialectical paradox to set forth a kind of creed which can be understood and which believes itself the genuine Christian faith. It might be that for all so far as an in the fashion of Kierkegaard secretly nourishes itself on the substance of Christianity which ignores in words, which it ignores in words. Why, the significance of a Nietzsche is no clearer. His effect in Germany was like that of no other philosopher. But it seems as though every attitude, every worldview, every every conviction, every conviction <laughs> claims him, claims, claims him as an authority. Author authority. It might be, and none of us really knows what this thought includes and does. The significance of Nietzsche is no clear. His effect in Germany was like that of no other philosopher, but it seems as though every attitude, every worldview, every conviction claims him as authority. It might be that none of us really knows what this thought includes and does. Two. Their distorting influence. The problem, therefore, for everyone who allows Kierkegaard and Nietzsche to influence him is to become honest about how he really comes to terms with them, what they are to him, and what he can make out of them. Their common effect to enchant and to, en <laughs> to enchant and then to disillusion, to seize and then leave one standing unsatisfied as though one's hands and heart were left empty. Such is only a clear expression of their own intention that everything depends upon what their reader, by his own inner action, makes out of their communication. Where there is no specific content, as in, in the special sciences, works of art, philosophical systems, or some accepted prophecy, they deny every satisfaction. Three, the problem of philosophizing in relation to both. 
In fact, they are exceptions and not models for followers. Whenever anyone has tried to imitate Kierkegaard or Nietzsche, if only in style, he has become ridiculous. What they did themselves at moments approaches the limit where the sublime passes into the ridiculous. What they did was only possible once. To be sure, everything great is unique and can never be re repeated identically, but there is something essentially different in our relation to this uniqueness. And this, whether we live through them, and by making them our own, revive them, or see them through the distance of an orientation which changes us, but makes them more remote. More <laughs> remote. They abandon us without giving us any final goals and without posing any definite problems. Through them, each one can only become what he himself is. What their consequences are is not yet decided even today. The question is how those of us shall live who are not exceptions, but who are seeking our inner way in light of these exceptions. We are in that cultural situation where the application of this knowledge already contains the kernel of dishonesty. It is as though through them we were forced out of a certain thoughtlessness, which without them would have remained even in the study of great philosophers. We cannot, we can no longer tranquilly proceed in the, con in the continuity of a traditional intellectual education, for through Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, consequences on all sides have not yet come to light. They posed a question which is not yet clear, but which one can feel. A question, this question is still open, through them, we have become aware that for us, there is no longer any self-evident foundation. There is no longer any secure background for our thought. For the individual working with them, there are two equally great dangers, really, to encounter them and not to take them seriously at all. Unavoidably, one's attitude toward them is ambivalent. Neither constructs the world, and both seems to have destroyed everything. Yet both were positive spirits. We must achieve a distinctly new relation to the creative thinker if we are really to approach them otherwise than we would any great man. Jasper's part three, rather question, the question, what now, or number four, page 182. With respect to our epoch and the thought of Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, if we pose the question, what now, then Kierkegaard points in the direction of an absurd Christianity before which the world sinks away, and Nietzsche points to the distance, the indeterminate, which does not appear to be a substance out of which we can live. Nobody has accepted their answers. They are not ours. It is for us to see what will become of us through ourselves as we look upon them. That is, however, in no way, this is, however, in no way to sketch out or establish anything in advance. Thus, we would err if we thought we could deduce what must now happen from a world historical survey of the development of the human spirit. We do not stand outside like a god who can survey the whole at a glance. For us, the present cannot be replaced by some supposed world history out of which our situation and problems would emerge. And this lecture has no intention of surveying the whole but rather of making the present situation perceptible by reflecting upon the past. Nobody knows where man and his thinking are going, since existence man and his world are not at an end. A completed philosophy is as little possible as an anticipation of the whole. We men have plans with finite ends, but something else always comes out which no one wills. In the same way, philosophizing is an act which works upon the inwardness of man, but whose final meaning he cannot know. Thus the contemporary problem is not to be deduced from some a priori whole, rather it is to be brought to consciousness out of a basis which is now experienced and out of a content still unclearly willed. Philosophy as thought is always a consciousness of being which is complete for this moment, but which knows it has no final permanence in its form of expression. Five. The problem we have abstracted from the situation, reason and existence. Instead of some supposed total view of the actual and cultural situation, rather we philosophize in consciousness of a situation which again leads to the final limits and bases of the human reality. Today no one can completely and clearly develop uh, the intellectual problems that grow out of such a situation. 
we live, so to speak, in a seething cauldron of possibilities, continually threatened by confusion, but always ready, in spite of everything, to rise up again. In philosophizing, we must always be ready, out of the present questioning, to elicit those ideas which bring forth what is real to us, that is, our humanity. These ideas are possible when the horizon remains unlimited, the reality is clear, and the real selves and the real questions manifest. Out of such problems which force themselves upon thought, I have selected for the next three lectures the ancient philosophical problem, which appears in the relation of the, re of the rational to the non-rational, must be seen in a new light through an appropriation of the tradition with our eyes upon Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. We formulate this fundamental problem as that of reason and existence. This abbreviated formula signifies no antithesis, rather a connection, which at the same time points beyond itself. The words reason and existence are chosen because for us they express in the most penetrating and pure form the problem of the clarification of the dark, the grasping of the bases out of which we live, presupposing no transparency, but demanding the maximum of rationality. The word reason has here its Kantian scope, clarity and truth. The word existence, through Kierkegaard, has taken on a sense through which we look into infinite depths at what defies all determinate knowledge. The word is not to be taken in its worn-out sense as one of the many synonyms for being, synonyms for being, or it or is to be taken with its Kierkegaardian claims. What we shall undertake in the next three lectures may seem to move around other themes, but in common they shall strive to grasp in the form of logically conceived questions the meaning of what is closest to life. Philosophy, wherever it is successful, consists of those unique ideas in which logical abstractness and the actual present become, so to speak, identical. The basic drives of living philosophy can express themselves truly only in purely formal thought. There are intellectual operations which, through comprehension and cooperation, can bring about an inner act of the entire man, the bringing forth of oneself out of possibilities and thoughts so as to apprehend being in empirical existence. If my lectures do not come even close to satisfying these high demands, it is still essential that the ideal of one's concerns be recognized. One can take courage to try to do that which passes beyond his strength from the fact that it is a human problem, and man is that creature which poses problems beyond his powers, and also from this that whoever even once thought he heard softly the authentic philosophic note can never tire of trying to communicate it. 3. The Encompassing Introduction, the meaning of philosophical logic. One possible way of philosophizing is the movement of philosophical logic in those acts of thought which formally represent the various modes of being, since we shall make an initial investigation of this possibility in the three middle lectures. Here we shall ignore all concrete philosophizing, that is, the development of particular physical, existential, or metaphysical subjects. Rather, we shall be concerned with the horizons and forms within which philosophical contents can be established without deception, horizons which became visible when our humanity was pushed to its very limits by Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. One. The question of the encompassing. In order to see most clearly into what is true and real, into what is no longer fastened to any particular thing or colored by any particular atmosphere, we must push into the widest range of the possible, and then we experience the following. Everything that is an object for us, even though it be the greatest, is still always within another, is not yet all. Wherever we arrive, the horizons which the horizon which includes the attained itself goes further and forces us to give up any final rest. We can secure no standpoint from which a closed whole of being would be surveyable, nor any sequence of standpoints through those through whose totality being would be given oh my goodness. We can secure no standpoint from which a closed whole of being would be surveyable, nor any sequence of standpoints through whose totality being would be given even indirectly. We always live and think within a horizon, but the very fact that it is a horizon indicates something further, which, again, surrounds the given horizon. From this situation arises the question about the encompassing. The encompassing is not a horizon within which every determinate mode of being in truth emerges for us, but rather that within which every particular horizon is enclosed. 
as in something absolutely comprehensive, which is no longer visible as a horizon at all. The two modes of the encompassing. The encompassing appears and disappears for us in two opposed perspectives, either as being itself in and through which we are, or else as the encompassing which we ourselves are, and which and in which every mode of being appears to us. The latter would be as the medium or condition under which all being appears as being for us. In neither case is the encompassing the sun of some provisional kind of being, a part of whose content we know, but rather it is the whole as the most extreme self-supporting ground of being, whether it is being in itself or being as it is for us. All of our natural knowledge and dealings with things lies between these final and no longer conditioned bases of encompassing being. The encompassing never appears as an object in experience, nor as an explicit theme of thinking, and therefore might seem to be empty. But precisely here is where the possibility for our deepest insight into being arises, whereas all other knowledge about being is merely knowledge of particular individual being. Knowledge of the many must always... Uh, knowledge of the many always leads to distraction. One runs into the infinite unless one arbitrarily sets a limit by some unquestioned purpose or contingent interest. And in that case, precisely at these limits, one always runs into bewildering difficulties. Knowledge about the encompassing would put all the knowledgeable as a whole under such conditions. Number three, historical reflections on this basic philosophical question. To seek this being itself beyond the endlessness of the particular and partial was the first and is always the new way of philosophizing. This is what Aristotle meant when he said, and indeed the question which was raised of old and is raised now and always, and is ever the subject of doubt is, what is being? Metaphysics, 1028 B.C. Schnelling, uh, sorry, Schelling, too, held it to be the oldest and most correct explanation of what philosophy is, that is, the science of being. But to find what being is, that is, true being, that is the difficulty, hoc opus, hic labor est. Roman numeral 2, 3, comma, 76. That from the beginning of philosophy up to the present, that this, this question continually recurs, might arouse confidence in the abiding fundamental meaning of philosophy throughout its almost endless multiplicities of appearance. The first difficulty is to understand the question correctly. And the correct understanding of the question shows itself in the answer. It shows itself in the degree to which we can appropriate the truth and reject the falsity of historically given questions and answers in their basic and connected meaning. But such a task, in light of the enormous projects and catastrophes of philosophy, can be accomplished neither through a collection of ideas nor through forcibly limiting it to some supposedly basic feature to which everything is to be added. We must presuppose a philosophic attitude whose passion for the truth in a continuing attempt to grasp one's own existence achieves awareness of an unlimited range by continued questioning. In such an unlimited range, the simplicity of the origin may finally be given truly. Of the two approaches to being as the encompassing, the most usual and most natural way for every beginning philosophy is toward being in itself, conceived as nature, world, or God. However, we shall approach it from the other, and since Kant unavoidable way, we shall search into the encompassing which we are, although we know, or at least take into account the fact that the encompassing which we are, which we are, is in no wise being itself. Still, this can be seen in critical purity, only after we have gone to the end of the path opened up by Kant. Roman number one, the encompassing which we are, empirical existence, consciousness as such, spirit. Whether we call the encompassing which we are, our empirical existence, consciousness as such, or spirit, in no case can it be grasped as though it were something in the world which appeared before us. Rather, it is that in which all other things appear to us. In general, we do not appropriately cognize it as an object. Rather, we become aware of it as a limit. This is confirmed when we, when we abandon the determinant clear, because objective knowledge, which is directed to particular things distinguishable from other things, 
we should like, so to speak, to stand outside ourselves in order to look and see what we are. But in this supposed looking, we are and always remain enclosed within that at which we are looking. Let us consider for a moment some beginnings from which, by repeated questioning, the encompassing can be conceived. I am, first of all, an empirical existence. Empirical existence means the actual taken comprehensively, which immediately shows itself to empirical consciousness in the particular particularities of the of matter, living body, and soul, but which, as such particularities, is no longer the encompassing of empirical existence. Everything which is empirically actual for me must in some sense be actual as a part of my being, as, for example, in a continually perceptible persistence, uh, presence of my body as it is touched, altered, or as it is perceiving. Empirical existence as the overpowering other which determines me is the world. The encompassing of empirical existence which I am when made into an object also becomes something alien like the world. <clears throat> as soon as our empirical existence becomes an object for investigation, we become absorbed into the being of the world which is that incomprehensible other, nature. In this fashion we are apprehended only as one sort of being among others, not yet as properly human. Knowledge of the encompassing of empirical existence with which we are united removes from particular sciences the claim of grasping us as a whole. Although I can never comprehend my empirical existence as an encompassing, but only particular empirical forms like matter, life, and soul, which I can never reduce back to a single principle, still I stand in the continuous presence of this embracing empirical reality. But even if we know the body, life, the soul, and consciousness, merely as they become objectively accessible to us, even here we can, so to speak, see through them, all back to that encompassing of empirical existence with which we are one, and which becomes only particularized in every physical, biological, and psychological object, but which, as such, is no longer the encompassing. Thus the empirical awareness which I have as a living actuality is, as such, not constitutive by itself of that encompassing which I am as an empirical existent. The second mode of the encompassing which I am is consciousness as such, only what appears to our consciousness as experienceable as an object as being for us what does not appear to consciousness what can in no wise touch our cognition is as good as nothing for us hence everything which exists for us must take on that form in which it can be thought or experienced by consciousness it must in some fashion appear in the form of an object it must become present through some temporal act of consciousness it must become articulated and thereby communicable through its thinkability. That whole being for us must appear in those forms under which it can enter into consciousness is what imprisons us in the encompassing of thinkability. But what? But we can make clear its limits, and with this consciousness of limits become open to the possibility of the other which we do not know. Consciousness has two meanings, however. I, we are conscious as living existence and as such are not yet or no longer encompassing. This consciousness is carried by life itself. The unconscious ground what we, the unconscious ground of what we consciously experience as living existence which we are in an absolute encompassing of empirical existence, we become possible objects of empirical investigation for ourselves. We find ourselves divided into groups of races and into those always particular individualities into which this form of reality divides itself. However, we are not only countless single consciousnesses, which are more or less similar to one another, we are also therein two consciousnesses as such. Through such consciousnesses, we can we think we can refer to being. Not only in similar ways of perception and feeling, but in an identical way. Contrasting with empirical consciousness, this is the other sense of consciousness which we are as encompassing. There is a leap between the multiplicity of subjective consciousness, consciousness and the universal validity of that true consciousness which can only be one. 
as the consciousness of living beings, we are split into the multiplicity of endless particular realities, imprisoned in the narrowness of the individual and not encompassing. As consciousness in general, we participate in an, actu in an inactuality. The universally valid truth and as such consciousness are an infinite encompassing. As a consciousness living actuality, we are always a mere kind, even a unique individual enclosed within its own individuality, but we participate in the encompassing through the possibility of knowledge and through the possibility of common knowledge of being in every form in which it appears through consciousness. And, indeed, we participate not only in the validity of the knowable, but also in a universally recognized formal lawfulness in willing action and feeling. So to find truth is timeless, and now our temporal actuality is a more or less complete actualization of this timeless permanence. This sharp separation, however, between the actuality of living consciousness in its temporal process and the inactuality of consciousness in general as the site of the timeless meaning of the one common truth is not absolute. Rather, it is an abstraction which can be transcended through the clarification of the encompassing. The actual existence of this timeless meaning insofar as it is something produced, something temporal, which grasps and moves itself is a new sense of the encompassing, and this is called spirit. Spirit is the third mode of the encompassing, which we are, out of the origins of its being. Spirit is the totality of intelligible thought, action, and feeling, a totality which is not a closed object for knowledge, but remains idea. Although spirit is necessarily oriented to the truth of consciousness as such, as well as to the actuality of its other, nature as it's as known and used. Yet in both directions it is moved by ideas which bring everything into clarity and connection. Spirit is the comprehensive reality of activity which is actualized by itself and by what it encounters in a world which is always given yet always being changed. It is the process of fusing and reconstructing all totalities in a present which is never finished yet always fulfilled. It is always on its way toward a possible completion of empirical existence, where universality, the whole, and every particular would all be members of a totality, out of a continuously actual and continuously fragmenting whole it pushes forward, creating again and again, out of its contemporary origins, its own possible reality. Since it pushes toward the whole, spirit would preserve, enhance, and relate everything to everything else, exclude nothing and give to everything its place and limits. Spirit, in contrast to the abstraction of timeless consciousness as such, is again a temporal process, and as such it is comparable to empirical existence, but as distinguished from this latter, it moves by a reflex, reflexivity of knowledge instead of by some merely biological, psychological process understood from within and not capable of being investigated as a natural object, spirit is always directed toward the universality of consciousness as such. Thus, it is a grasping of itself, a working upon itself uh, through denial and approval. It produces itself by struggling with itself. As mere empirical existence and as spirit, we are encompassing reality, but as empirical existence, we are unconsciously bound to our ultimate basis in matter, life, and the psyche. When we understand ourselves as objects in this horizon, we see ourselves in an infinite and only from this horizon, and only from the outside. We become split from one another, and only as thus split are we objects of scientific investigation as matter, living beings, psyches, but as spirit. We are consciously related to everything which is comprehensible to us. We transform the world and ourselves into the intelligible, which encloses totalities. As objects in this mode of the encompassing, we know ourselves from within as the one unique, all-embracing reality which is wholly spirit and only spirit. The distinctions of empirical existence, consciousness as such, and spirit do not imply separable facts. Rather, they represent three starting points through which we can come to feel that comprehensive being which we are and in which all being and everything scientifically investigable appears. These three modes 
taken individually are not yet the encompassing as we represent it. Consciousness as such, the location of universality, universally valid truth, consciousness as such, the location of universally valid truth, is in itself nothing independent. On one side it points to its basis in empirical existence, on the other it points to spirit, the power it must let itself be dominated by if it would attain meaning and totality. In itself, consciousness as such is an unreal articulation of the encompassing. Through it, the encompassing is differentiated into those modes according to one of which the encompassing can become individuated and knowable as empirical natural processes and according to the other of which it is understandable, a self-transparent totalitizing reality or freedom. Empirical existence and spirit produce forms of reality. Consciousness, as such, is the form in which we envisage the encompassing as the condition of the universally valid and communicable. Two, Roman numeral, the encompassing as being itself world and transcendence. We pass beyond the encompassing which we are, empirical existence, consciousness as such, and spirit, when we ask whether this whole is being itself. If being itself is that in which everything that is for us must become present, then it might be thought that this appearance for us is in fact all being. Thus Nietzsche, who conceived all being as interpretation, and our being as interpretive, wanted to reject any further being as an illusory other world. But the question does not stop the limits of our knowledge of things, nor in the inwardness of the limiting consciousness of the encompassing which we are. Rather, this encompassing which I am and know as empirical existence, consciousness as such, and spirit is not conceivable in itself, but refers beyond itself. The encompassing which we are is not being itself, but rather the genuine appearance and the encompassing of being itself. This being itself, which we feel as indicated at the limits, and which therefore is the last thing we reach through questioning from our situation, is in itself the first. It is not made by us, it is not interpretation, and it is not an object. Rather, it is itself. It itself brings forth our questioning and permits it no rest. The encompassing which we are has one of its limits in fact. Even though we create the form of everything that we know, since it must appear to us in those modes according to which it can become an object, yet knowledge cannot create the least particle of dust in its empirical existence. In the same way, being itself is that which shows an immeasurable number of appearances to inquiry, but it itself always recedes and only manifests itself indirectly as that determinate empirical existence we encounter in the progress of our experiences and in the regularity of processes in all their particularity. We call it the world. The encompassing which we are has its other limit in the question through which it is. Being itself is the transcendence which shows itself to no investigative experience, not even indirectly. It is that which as the absolute encompassing just as certainly is as it remains unseen and unknown. Roman numeral three, existence, animation, and ground of all modes of the encompassing. Any philosopher who is not lost in the perspective of the conceptual, but wishes to push toward genuine being, feels a deep dissatisfaction looking at all the hitherto mentioned modes of the encompassing. He knows too little in the vast su superfluity of apparently immeasurable multiplicities toward which he is directed, he cannot find being itself in all the dimensions of an encompassing so conceived. He is liberated into a vastness, where being becomes void. The transcendent seems to be merely an unknowable, which makes no difference, and the spirit comes to seem like a sublime whole, but one in which each individual in his deepest inwardness almost seems to have disappeared. The central point of philosophizing is the first is first reached in the awareness of potential existence. Existence is the encompassing, not in the sense of the vastness of a horizon, of all horizons, but rather in the sense of a fundamental origin, a condition of selfhood without which all the vastness of being becomes a desert. Existence, although never itself becoming an object or form, carries the meaning of every mode of the encompassing. 
while mere empirical existence, consciousness as such, and spirit all appear in the world and become scientifically investigable realities, existence is the object of no science, in spite of which we find here the very axis about which everything in the world turns if it is to have any genuine meaning for us. At first, existence seems to be a new narrowing, for it is always merely one among others. It might appear as though the spaciousness of the encompassing had been contracted into the uniqueness of the individual self, which, in contrast to the reality of the encompassing spirit, looks like the emptiness of a point. But this contracted point lodged, so to speak, in the body of empirical existence, in this particular consciousness, and in this spirit, is in fact the sole possible revelation of the depths of being as historicity. Historicity. In all modes of the encompassing, the self can become genuinely certain of itself only as existence. If we first contrast existence with consciousness as such, it becomes the hidden ground in me to which transcendence is first revealed. The encompassing which we are exists only in relation to something other than itself. Thus, I am consciousness only insofar as I have something else as an objective being before me, by which I then am determined and with which I am concerned. So also I am existence only as I know transcendence has the power through which I genuinely am myself. The other is either the being which is in the world for consciousness as such, or it is transcendence for existence. This twofold other first becomes clear through the inwardness of existence. Without existence, the meaning of transcendence is lost. It remains only something indifferent and not to be known, something supposed to be at the bottom of things, something excogiated, or perhaps for our animal consciousness, something weird or terrifying, plunging it into superstition and anxiety. A subject to be investigated psychologically and removed through a rational insight into the factual by consciousness as such. Only through existence can transcendence become present without superstition, as the genuine reality which to itself never disappears. Further, existence is like the counterpart to spirit, Spirit is the will to become whole. Potential existence is the will to be authentic. Spirit is intelligible throughout, coming to itself in the whole, but existence is the unintelligible standing by and against other existence and breaking up every whole and never reaching any real totality. For spirit, a final transparency would be the origin of being. Existence, on the other hand, remains in all clarity of spirit as the irremediable irremediably dark origin. Spirit lets everything disappear and vanish into a universality and totality. The individual as spirit is not himself, but, so to speak, the unity of contingent individuals and of the necessary universal. Existence, however, is irreducibly in, a, in another. It is the absolutely firm, the irreplaceable, and therefore, as against all mere empirical existence, consciousness as such, and spirit, is, it is authentic being before transcendence, to which alone it surrenders itself without reservation. Spirit wants to grasp the individual either as an example of universal, of a universal, or as a part of a whole. On the other hand, existence, as the possibility of decision derivable from no universal validity, is an origin in time, is the individual as historicity. It is the apprehension of timelessness through temporality, not through universal concepts. Spirit is historical by representing itself in retrospect as a transparent totality. Existence is historical as eternity in time, as the absolute historicity of its concrete empirical existence in a spiritual opacity which, it is, which is never removed. But existence is not merely this incompletion and perversity in all temporal existence, which as such must always expand and change into some spiritual totality, but rather temporal existence thoroughly and authentically authentically <laughs> penetrated. The paradox of the unity of temporality and eternity. Spirit, in its immediacy, is the potential idea whose universality unfolds into full clarity. Existence, in its immediacy, on the other hand, is its historicity in relation to transcendence, i.e., the irremovable immediacy of its faith. 
The faith of spirit is the life of universal idea, of the universal idea, where thought is being ultimately is valid. The faith of existent, however, is the absolute in existent itself on which everything for it rests, in which spirit consciousness as such and empirical existence are all bound together and decided, where for the first time there is both impulse and goal. Here Kierkegaard's proposition faith is being applies. When existence understands itself, it is not like my understanding of another, nor the sort of understanding whose contents can be abstracted from the person understanding, nor a sort of looking at, rather it is an origin which itself first arises in its own self-clarification. It is not like sharing in something else, but it is at once the understanding and the being of what is understood. It is not understanding through universals, but moves uh, above such understanding in the medium of spirit to become an understanding without any generalization in the absolute present. Indeed, in love and in every form of absolute consciousness, it is the difference between the love of another, which I understand but yet never really understand, and my own love, which I understand because I am that love. Or, in other words, the difference between understanding other things by empathy as process or experience and understanding myself as unique since I know myself before transcendence. When we compare existence with consciousness as such, spirit or any other mode of the encompassing, the same thing appears. Without existence, everything seems empty, hollowed out, without ground, fake, because everything has turned into endless masks, mere possibilities or mere empirical existence. Roman numeral four, reason, the bond between the various modes of the encompassing. We have seen as modes of the encompassing, A, being, as the other, which was either world, empirical existence, which can be investigated in a universally valid way, or transcendence, as being in itself. B, the being of the encompassing, which we are, which was either our empirical existence, the still indeterminate comprehensive actuality, or consciousness as such, the site of all objective and intelligible validities for us, or spirit, the single whole of coherent movement of consciousness as it is activated by ideas. But for the source from which all these modes of the encompassing receive animation and for which they speak, we touched upon existence, the dark ground of selfhood, the concealment out of which I come to encounter myself and for which transcendence first becomes real. Inextricably bound to existence is something else which concerns the connection of all these modes of the encompassing. This is no new whole, but rather a continuing demand, demand and movement. It is not a mode through which the encompassing appears, but rather the bond which unites all modes of the encompassing. It is called reason. There is a question as to what reason means in the history of philosophy, how it comprehended itself, what it means for Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, what they meant when they both trusted and mistrusted it. The clarification of the modes of the encompassing must go into the ambiguity of what has passed for reason. If reason means clear, objective thinking, the transformation of the opaque into the transparent, then it is nothing more than the encompassing of consciousness as such, so considered it would be better to call it, in accordance with the tradition of German idealism, understanding the stand. If reason means the way to totalities, the life of the idea, then it is the encompassing of spirit. But if reason means the preeminence of thought in all modes of the encompassing, then more is included than mere thinking. It is then what goes beyond all limits, the omnipresent demand of thought that not only grasps what is universally valid and is all rationally in uh, the sense of being a law or principle of order of some process, but also brings to light the other, stands before the absolutely counter-rational, touching it and bringing it too into being. Reason, through the preeminence of thought, can bring all the modes of the encompassing to light by continually transcending limits, without itself being an encompassing like them. It is, so to speak, like the final authentic encompassing which continually must withdraw and remain inconceivable except in those modes of the encompassing in which it moves.
Reason of itself is no source, but as it is an encompassing bond, it is like a source in which all sources first come to light. It is the unrest which permits acquiescence in nothing. It forces a break with the immediacy of the unconscious in every mode of the encompassing which we are. It pushes on continually, but it is also that which can effect the great peace, not the peace of a self-confident rational whole, but that of being itself opened up to us through reason. Reason is the inextinguishable impulse to philosophize with whose destruction reason itself is destroyed. This impulse is to achieve reason, to restore reason. It is that reason which always rises clearer from all the devastations, from all the deviations and narrowings of so-called reason, and which can acknowledge the justice of objections to reason and set their limits. Reason should not get caught within any mode of the encompassing, not empirical existence to favor a will to exist, which in its very narrowest narrowness assert, <coughs> which in its very narrowness asserts itself purposefully, yet blindly, nor in consciousness as such in favor of endless validities which are indifferent to us, nor in spirit of favor of a self-enclosed harmonious totality which can be contemplated but not lived. Reason is always too little when it is enclosed within final and determinate forms, and it is always too much when it appears as a self-sufficient substitute. With the rational attitude I desire unlimited clarity, I try to know scientifically, to grasp empirically, real, and the compelling validities of the thinkable. To grasp the empirically real and the compelling validities of the thinkable. But at the same time, I have lived with an awareness of the limits of scientific penetrability and of clarity in general. However, I push forward from, I push forward from all sources and all modes of the encompassing toward a universal unfolding of them in thought and reject, above all, thoughtlessness. But reason itself is no timeless permanence. It is neither a quiet realm of truth, such as the contents of scientific cognition, whose validity does not change, although their attainment is an endless and restless movement, nor is it being itself. Neither is it the mere moment of some chance thought. Rather, it is the binding, recollecting, and progressive power whose contents are always derived from its own limits, and which passes beyond every one of these limits, expressing perpetual dissatisfaction. It appears in all forms of the modes of the encompassing Yet seems to be nothing itself, a bond which does not rest upon itself, but always on something else, out of which reason produces both what it itself is and what it can be. Reason drives toward unity, but it is not satisfied either with one level of knowable accuracies for consciousness as such, or with the great effective unities of spirit. It goes along just as well with existence, where the latter breaks through these unities, and so reason is again present in order to bring existence, existence in separated by an abyss of absolute distance together into communication. Its essence seems to be the universal, that which pushes toward law and order, <coughs> or is identical with it, but it remains a possibility in existence even when these fail. Reason is itself still the only thing by and for which the chaos of the negative in its passion for night preserves its mode of potential existence, a reason which otherwise would not be surrendered to what is absolutely alien at these extreme limits. Roman numeral five, reason and existence. The great poles of our being, which encounter one another in every mode of the encompassing, are thus reason and existence, they are inseparable. Each disappears with the disappearance of the other. Reason should not surrender to existence to produce an isolating defiance which resists communication and despair. Existence should not surrender to reason in favor of a transparency which is substituted for substantial reality. No, that's not right. The great poles of our being, which encounter one another in every mode of the encompassing, are thus reason and existence. They are inseparable. Each disappears with the disappearance of the other. Reason should not surrender to existence to produce an isolating defiance which resists communication and despair. Existence should not surrender to reason in favor of a transparency which is substituted for substantial reality. Existence only becomes clear through reason. Reason only has content through existence. There is an impulse in reason to move out of the immobility and endless triviality of the merely correct into a living bond through the totality of the ideas of the spirit 
and out of these toward existence as that which supports and first gives authentic being to the spirit. Reason is oriented toward, toward its other, toward the content of the existence which supports it, which clarifies itself in reason, and which gives decisive impulses to reason. Reason without content would be mere understanding. Without any basis is reason. And as the concepts of the understanding are empty without intuition, so reason is hollow without existence. Reason is not itself as mere understanding, but only in the acts of potential existence. But existence is also oriented toward another. It is related to transcendence through which it first becomes an independent cause in the world, for existence did not create itself. Without transcendence, existence becomes a sterile, loveless, and demonic defiance. Existence oriented to reason through whose clarity at first experiences unrest and the appeal of transcendence under the needling question of reason first comes into its own authentic movement. Without reason, existence is inactive, sleeping, and as though not there. Thus, reason and existence are not two opposed powers which struggle with one another for victory. Each exists only through the other. They mutually develop one another and find through one another clarity and reality. Although they never combine into an ultimate whole, every genuine accomplishment is whole only through them. Reason without existence, even in the richest possible field, finally passes into an indifferent thinking, a merely intellectual movement of consciousness as such, or into a dialectic of the spirit. And as it slips away into intellectual universality without the binding root of its historicity, it ceases to be reason. Irrational existence, which rests upon feeling, experiencing unquestioned impulse, instinct, or whim, ends up as blind violence, and therewith falls under the empirical laws which govern these actual forces. Without historicity, laws lost in the mere particularities, po particularities of contingent uh, empirical existence and a self-assertion unrelated to transcendence, it ceases to be existence. existence. Oh, goodness. Irrational existence, which rests upon feeling, experiencing unquestioned impulse, instinct, or whim, ends up as blind violence and therewith falls under the empirical laws which govern these actual forces. Without historicity, lost in the mere particularities of contingent empirical existence in a self-assertion unrelated to transcendence, it ceases to be existence. Each without the other loses the genuine continu continuity of being, and therefore the reliability which, although it cannot be calculated, is nevertheless appropriate to genuine reason and existence. They separate themselves from one another only to become violent powers lacking in any communication. In isolation they no longer mean what they should. Only formulas without either basis or purpose remain. In a narrowing sphere or empirical existence there, through a veil of justifications which are no longer true and no longer believed, they are simply the means of expression for mutually destructive empirical existence. Existence. But there is rest nowhere in temporal existence. Rather, there is always movement issuing forth from the ultimate substantial ground movement in the tension between the individual and the universal, between the actual and the total range of the possible, between the unquestionable immediacy of ex existential faith and the infinite movement of reason. Roman numeral six, reflections on the significance of the form of this basic idea. After the survey of how we think the modes of the encompassing which we are and which being itself is and the polarity of reason and existence, let us now reflect on what such ideas formally considered can and cannot mean, ideas whose development has given rise to the whole philosophies, two whole philosophies. Our knowledge of objects in the world has, from, has the form of relating them to one another and deriving them from one another. What appears to us uh, is understood by understanding its relation to something else. But where in philosophizing we are concerned with the encompassing, it is clear that we are dealing with something which cannot be understood like some object in the world. More especially, we find that the modes of the encompassing cannot be derived from some particular which appears in them. For example... If we call the encompassing thought, we cannot derive thought itself from anything which can be thought of. Or, if the encompassing is our consciousness, it cannot be derived from anything which appears to this consciousness. Or, if it is the whole, it cannot be derived from any individual 
be it ever so comprehensive. For if it is empirical existence, then as such it can never be derived from any determinate, objectively known empirical thing. If it is reason, then we cannot derive it from the non-rational. For if it is existence, it cannot be derived from any mode of the encompassing, let alone one of its contents. In short, our being can never be derived from anything which appears to us. I myself cannot, I myself can never be understood through anything which I encounter. Just as little can being in itself can be be derived from any being which we know. Just as little can being in itself be derived from any being which we know. If we call it being, it can never be derived from the multiplicity of beings. If it is being in itself, it can never be derived from appearance. If it is transcendent, we find we can never derive the absolute from the objective, actual or empirically existent. There always arises in thinking man that which passes beyond everything of which he thinks. In philosophy, there has also been a contrary tendency to deduce from being as such as the encompassing was regarded the particular things we objectively know. To deduce the whole world, ourselves included from a philosophically cognized origin, just as we grasp things in the world through their causes. This is, again, always a radical error which destroys philosophizing itself. From the encompassing can never be known as for the encompassing can never be known as a particular something from which other things can be deduced. Every object of thought, be it ever so comprehensive, every conceived whole, every objectively conceived encompassing remains as an object merely an individual, for it has other objects outside it, and also stands over against us. And also stands over against us. The encompassing itself, whether it be the encompassing which we are, or being in itself, escapes from every determinant objectivity. Objectivity. Insofar as we are that encompassing, it can only be illuminated insofar as it is thought of as being in itself. It is apprehended by inquiry into its infinite appearance, insofar as it, is, as it speaks as transcendence. It is heard by absolute historical existence. Therefore, since the encompassing is in no form known in itself, we cannot deduce from it the being which appears to us. That could only occur if the encompassing were previously known in itself. These false derivations proceed as though they had already cognitively mastered being itself. These deductions from one principle, perhaps in the form of a deduction of all categories of the thinkable and of whatever we can encounter in the world, are always merely relative derivations of individual groups in their connections. An exhaustive deduction has never succeeded and never can succeed. The attempt, however, has the value of sharpening our awareness of our limits. Deductions of actual occurrences from theories of some fundamental reality construct models, but they never succeed in grasping anything except limited realities, mere aspects of empirical existence. They prove themselves to be functions of an endlessly progressive knowing. But they are never what in intention they might well like to be, cognition of the real in itself. The deduction of the whole world, including ourselves, from transcendence by emanation, evolution, causality, etc., is imaginary. The idea of creation is the expression of a primal secret, of an inconceivability. The subversion of the question of an uncaused cause. However the encompassing is conceived, the idea seems for a moment to achieve stability when it appears as an object for scientific research. This actually occurs in all modes of the encompassing. The error lies in trying to secure as a content for knowledge what is true only as a limit for consciousness and a demand of the self. The encompassing in the form of empirical existence consciousness as such, or spirit, becomes an apparent object for anthropology, psychology, sociology, and the humanistic sciences. These sciences investigate human phenomena in the world, but in such a fashion that what they grasp is precisely not the encompassing reality of this kind of being, a reality which is always present to it even though unrecognized. No history or sociology of religion has arrived in what they call religion at that which was the existence itself of man. They can only consider religion according to its factual character, 
observe how it emerges into the observable reality with a leap which is incomprehensible. All these sciences push towards something which is precisely what they can never reach. They have the fascination of being concerned with something genuinely relevant, but they deceive if they suppose they can grasp being itself through an, em through an eminence which deduces and establishes things. These universal sciences therefore cannot consolidate themselves. All their demarcations are only relative. Individually, they have the form of cutting across all other sciences, but they never seem to reach their own proper basis since the encompassing which they have before their eyes is no longer the encompassing. Their magic is deceptive, but it can become fruitful if there should ensue a sense of the modest, relative, and open character of <clears throat> of our knowledge of our own appearance in the world. Both reason and existence have a mode of thinking which awakens them and pushes them toward clarity. To reason belongs philosophical logic, and to existence, the clarification of existence. However, if logic pretends to be a universal science of consciousness as such, it loses its philosophical truth and slips into a deceptive science of the whole. In these magnificent doctrines of categories which unfold themselves out of a single principle, the whole of the encompassing as the totality of being itself in its form, the thought of God before creation, would be penetrated and reproduced. But these investigations have truth only within an open philosophical logic as an orientation toward the formal possibilities of thought in its many directions, which can only be added together and which are valid for objective appearance, but they are endless, and they lack any thoroughly controlling principle which is supposed to produce them. As the elucidation of reason by itself, logic is philosophy and, no longer, and no longer a supposedly objective cognition of the whole. The clarification of existence does not cognize existence, but makes an appeal to its potentialities. However, as an as an exi mm. However, as existentialism, it pretends to be discourse about a known object, and precisely because it should perceive its limits and seek to clarify the absolute ground, it only wanders deeper into error, trying to subsume appearances in the world cognitively and judgmentally under its concepts. Thus, the authentic idea of the encompassing disappears with every attempt to establish, isolate, and absolutize it. An encompassing which has become objective is no longer the true encompassing. The idea of the encompassing is rather, so to speak, a subverting idea which removes from us all the natural objectivity of our usual thought. In the world, we are concerned with things, contents, objects, but we never question in all this what we have, think, or will. We assert truths but do not ask what truth itself is. We have to do with questions about the world, but do not ask about the questioner, dominated by what is important in action or injury, as by something which is attainable and knowable. We never reach the limits from which this whole world of action, possession, and inquiry would become questionable. On the other hand, the limits of all that exists for us by giving up the usual cognition of objects. The idea of the encompassing requires of us a recognition of the limits of all that exists for us by giving up the usual cognition of objects. Since it sets limits to objective cognition, it frees the real man and all being which he touches from a supposed identity with its knowability or fixed knownness. Such thinking vitally encompasses the dead being of the known. This is a simple thought, but philosophically, one of the one of infinitely rich consequences. <clears throat> First, it concerns the thinker himself. I'm not authentically myself if I am merely what I know myself to be, in all modes of the schemata of the ego and their determination. Whenever I objectify myself, I am myself more than this object, namely, I am that being which can thus objectify itself. All characterizations of my being concern me only insofar as I am turned into an object, but in such an object I recognize only one side of myself or myself in one particular aspect, but not myself. If I understand myself exclusively as an empirical existence, 
as a living, natural being, since I have then objectified myself and conceived myself only insofar as I am an object, I have, at the same time, lost myself and substituted what I understand myself to be for what I can be. To the being of the encompassing belongs a self-awareness which sees itself just as much as empirical existence and life as it achieves a critical limiting awareness of itself as consciousness, as such and spirit. But it only becomes fully aware of itself without the improvement, without the impoverishment which comes from absolutizing some limited aspect and the consequent extinction of its potentialities as reason and existence. Now, if I were to soar beyond and conceive myself to be authentic being itself, i.e. regard myself as transcendent over and above mere empirical existence, consciousness, or spirit, I should again lose myself in false self-divinization and cease to be possible existence and its actualization. That I am over against all cognizable cognizable empirical existence in the world, and at the same time am posited in my self-created freedom through transcendence to affirm such as the position of man in temporal existence is the task on his small path from which he is constantly tempted to deviate, both in his thinking about himself and in the actual deeds which are connected therewith. Secondly, the idea of confirmed absolutely all-known being. I know this other, just as with myself, only as it appears to me, and not as it is in itself. No known being is being itself. Every time I let being itself slip into known being, transcendence disappears, and I become dark to myself. In spite of these continual deviations, we must think about the encompassing in order to make it really present. At first, even in a false specificity, but then, by passing through the whole process of these modes of thinking, the encompassing, we can transcend them and push to their source, which is no longer an object. Roman numeral seven, philosophical result. The purpose and therefore the meaning of a philosophical idea is not the cognition of an object, but rather an alteration of our consciousness of being and of our inner attitude toward things. Understanding the meaning of the encompassing has the significance of creating a possibility. The philosopher therein says to himself, preserve the open space of the encompassing. Do not lose yourself in what is merely known. Do not let yourself become separated from transcendence. In thinking about temporal existence, one must continually run through the circuit of the modes of the encompassing. We can remain static in none of its modes. Each demands the others. The loss of one mode lets all the others become false. The philosopher seeks to omit none. The modes are related to one another. The tension is not a battle where each seeks to annihilate the others, but rather a mutual enlivening and intensification. Hence, the polarity of reason and existence must be prevented from being a mutual exclusion. Rather, instead of each turning away from the other in hostility, each should grow through mutual questioning. The relation between the two is not that of flat re reciprocity, but goes up and down. One cannot expect that the higher will be automatically produced by the lower, or that the lower as a condition, the higher can or that with the lower as a condition, the higher can be depended upon to arise. For the higher has its own proper cause. The higher gives limits and order of rank to the lower without being able, however, to generate it. One should never forget the relation of every mode of the encompassing to every other, and the direction of this relation. So far, every mode of the encompassing appears in the light of reason as something relatively dark, and thus there is an external similarity among them in terms of more or less reason, an awareness of this requires that the philosopher not substitute mere vitality for existence or nature for transcendence. The open space of such philosophizing becomes a danger unless one keeps in steady consciousness one's potential existence. There is a danger that one may see oneself as lost through abstract thinking on the whole range of things. Genuine thinking about the encompassing, however, is reflected back from the total range of the revealed directions ever so much more decisively onto the concrete historicity of my own present. Now, for the first time, it is possible to be in the present without disappearing into the restrictions of the unthinking, the blind, and the unrelated. Now also it is possible to grasp the whole spaciousness of being without losing oneself in the void of mere universal of the understand uh, in 
in the void of the mere universal of the understanding, in the meaningless facticity of empirical existence, or in some empty beyond, for the determinateness of the historical depths is bound up with the openness of the of unlimited ranges of being, and the truth of one's own basis with their relation to the un grounded openness of being, existence with reason, the more unrestrictedly I penetrate by thought into the depths, the truer my love becomes in its historical present. Holdman said, who has thought about the deepest loves what is most alive? Man can seek the path of his truth in an unfanatical absoluteness, in a decisiveness which remains open.